Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and we discuss our analysis and research findings. This time we're going to talk about the movie called Kari Gurashi no Arieti, or also known as Arieti the Borrower, and also known as a different, the secret world of Arieti, I think, in the US, in the UK, something like that. Has many releases. Directed by first time director Hiromasa Yonobayashi in 2010. You can follow this podcast on purely audio form by downloading it as an mp3 or listening to it in your podcast app on Lipsyn. You can listen to us on Spotify or you can watch us on YouTube. However you choose to enjoy it, it will be available to you. With me on this podcast today are fellow longtime members, Platon Skull. Hello, that's me. Or a, a, a very, very, very tiny version of me. Uh, whose voice, for some reason, is, is still is normal. Uh, he, him. Thank you very much. And we have Voice Flower. Hello, I'm Voice Flower. My pronouns are she, her. And yeah, we are talking about this film, which has some really uh, uh, great little people in it that are magical, because yes, they, they cannot physically... Uh, exist as they do, but there is a lot of verisimilitude in this movie when it comes to animating the other things. But um, it's magic, okay? Oh, it, right, yeah, yeah, indeed. Sure. And it is also magic that I am your extraordinarily large host, Niad, going by he, him pronouns. So that's the power dynamic we set up so between the big and the small, you know, Platon. You put yourself in that spot. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not to blame for this. Yeah, but I, I I fill your like mundane existence me with, uh, with magic and wonder, you know. If you want to be the cat, <laughs> <laughs> the cat's base. What are you talking about? <laughs> hey, you know, at first the cat is like straight up out of a monster movie, like a kaiju attacking yeah, the world of the borrowers, true. like trying yeah. to cram its face through this like, you know, drainage grate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, before we get too far ahead of ourselves. Yes, uh, uh, Arietti. Uh, could, could we get get some background info? Indeed. So Arietti, yes. the borrower, also secret of Arietti. Interesting thing. So the story behind these two different English titles is simply that this movie, based on a British children's novel from the fifties, written by Mary Norton, simply titled The Borrowers, was adapted by the different dubbing studios, not only into the familiar, typical. Disney dub that we have, but also into a exclusively fully British dub, which has also changed the names of a ton of the characters from Japanese names to British names, which is really interesting. I don't know if you've checked out the British dub at all. I don't know why I'm talking about the dub first. I'm just so fascinated by by the fact that we have an exclusively British dub to like kind of tie into the you know the fact that it's an adaptation of a British children's story, and I listened to the British dub, and it's really endearing and cute because they're all yeah. talking in British accents because obviously they are. And yeah, I like show that. Is Tom Holland, like the, the kid Tom Holland. Yes, it has kid Tom Holland as and uh, and uh, Saoirse Ronan as uh, as Arietti. Like uh, I I think this is the only thing they've worked together on, which like yeah, I don't to, know to, like, who really she is. Big, uh, if you've seen Lady Bird, uh, no. If you've seen uh, Little Women, the, the new Little Women. Uh, she, she's like basically, she she's the uh, Robert De Niro to G Greta Gerwig's Martin Scorsese. I see. So, and she's also worked with Wes Anderson uh, and a, a bunch of others. So knowing that we have Tom Holland in this, did you also know that this was actually his uh, uh, theater release debut, his first time on the cinema, well, sound screen basically <laughs> no kidding yeah that was his start i didn't know that that's that's an interesting start to a cinema career i suppose where yeah you, that ended with yeah. disney's marvel super uh, spider that's about as as big as you can i think get. that's the exact title there you you got it in, in <laughs> one go yeah. marvel super spider <laughs> I think I think being one of the, no, 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 the I, I, yeah. I, th I think actually it's it's a uh, Disney's Marvel's Super Spider uh, prom party and then <laughs> Disney's Marvel's Super Spider's vacation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're kidding. we're so silly today. That's that's completely <laughs> all right. We have to we have to make up for the fact that we are just 
three people instead of the That's usual true. more people in those three, which is fine. Um, and we, we have, don't have our normal comic relief uh, experts, hipster. Yeah, uh, hipster. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're making do. We're making do. Yeah. Uh, j- just, just like the characters in this movie. Hey. Indeed. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about Hiromasa Yonobayashi, right? He has been yeah. taken as the first time director on this movie. And it is not just his first time directed movie. He is also, I think to date, well, there haven't been any other Ghibli directors. Spoiler alert. Um, he is the youngest director to be able to direct a movie at Studio Ghibli when he was just 36 when he started directing this movie. So that's yeah. a big credit and you know before that his career started sometimes in the 90s when he worked as like a key animator and in between animator on a couple of shows including serial experiments lane or in 2004 uh, in the show monster but also starting with mononoke hime he worked at studio ghibli first in between animator in for mononoke hime but afterwards immediately excelling to be one of the most promising key animators uh in being featured basically in every film afterwards as a key animator and often tasked with some very important scenes even, which he uh, which he uh, kind of comments on that he found quite challenging. But it seems that within the studio, he has been trusted to uh, accomplish a great many complicated and I- in intricate scene. So yeah. when it came to, you know, I can't tell you exactly why Miyazaki and Suzuki decided that they would have someone else direct this movie. My suspicion, and there's no comment on this, no official message on this, is that, of course, we continue the trend of them trying to get some young directors in the studio, knowing that they're all aging and, you know, becoming so old and they still haven't secured a new generation of Ghibli directors, which has been kind of a running theme throughout you know, the last couple of movies, especially with the idea that we they need young blood and they they seem to fail to capture young blood with, for example, yeah. during Howl's, we've discussed how um, um, Hosoda was originally going to direct the movie, but then didn't. And how disappointed Miyazaki was in his son's performance on Tales of Earth Sea. So there's... Yeah, you know, and, and, yeah. and of course, uh, uh, Kondo's uh, tragic uh, and. Kondo yeah, wouldn't have been young though. He's he's pretty, he was pretty much as old as they were. Maybe a little bit oh, younger, right. but yeah, he was a little a bit, bit younger, younger. As, as I remember. Just I like, think there's like there's like yeah. seven to ten years difference. Yeah, like there was a difference, but Kondo was a very old collaborator of the team. So right, right, right. right. Even okay, then, that sure. that wouldn't have been like the passing on of the torch in that sense. But with Yonobayashi being as young as he was at the start of the project. Um, it really was like an attempt to, you know, get someone fresh to do it. I don't know why Miyazaki didn't want to do it himself, because it is very clear that from all the interviews I could find and from the production notes, basically, that this was a movie that Miyazaki wanted to make for like a good 30 years at that point, at least. He had yeah, definitely. W- read The Borrower by, by Norton. He had the ideas, he wanted to really make this movie a reality. And when it came to pitching the next project after Ponyo, um, basically he and Suzuki had a little discussion about it. Miyazaki won and the decision was made to adapt the borrower, uh, the borrowers. And at that time, they just decided, okay, we need a director, but we don't know who. And there was one interview I saw where Miyazaki was pretty honest. It was a pretty funny interview, actually, because um, Miyazaki was interviewed before the film was finished, released. And it seems like it was one of those days where Miyazaki was grumpy. And he was just (laughs) tearing into Yonobayashi. (laughs) And one of the things he said was, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but we didn't know who to do, uh, who to get for this. And we just ran the first best person, and that was Yonei Bayashi. So, uh, (laughs) and he laughed. And like, yeah, it's kind of mean, right? Yeah, mm, whatever. Um, (laughs) <laughs> let's let's not let this deter us from giving <clears throat> Yonobayashi a fair shot because I think he did a really, really good job as a first-time director who, by the way, at first rejected the offer to direct this movie. So Miyazaki mm, right. also commented on this. Yonobayashi was always an animator and did not come to the studio with the intention to become a director. And he didn't want to direct. So Miyazaki w- tried to ask him, do you want to direct? And basically, Yonobayashi answered something along the lines of, no, because I think directors need a vision. 
they need to want to say something with their movie. And he didn't, so he declined the request. It seems then that Suzuki and Miyazaki replied to him and said, don't worry, it's all in the book. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was an interview yeah. with Suzuki that uh, talks a little bit about, it might be a little bit of, uh, you know, in retrospect, uh, why they chose Yonabayashi. Um, but I think it's worth noting. Well, for one thing, uh, why was Miyazaki not going to direct this film if he wanted to to do it? Apparently, he, there was a different film project he had already uh, was setting to do. And when Suzuki first suggested that they pick Yonabayashi for, um, for Arietti, um, Miyazaki was a little bit peeved about that. He kind of he kind of was a little bit like, hmm. Uh, he he didn't he didn't think that was such a good idea at first, or he was a bit hesitant to agree to that because he was going to miss having Yonabayashi be a key animator on his own film. Oh yeah. <laughs> um. So it was he was a little bit self interested there when it came to his, his own project, but but. Uh, uh, Suzuki also says that, you know, Yonabayashi was like really, not only was he really skilled as an animator, but he was really well liked at the studio and really beloved. And um, even by the the elder, uh, uh, you know, his elder colleagues uh, and animators and staff that uh, basically he had a way to sort of get everybody on his side. And this helped him a lot in in how he was able to uh, galvanize the team as a director. And actually, I think that's a good word to use because the production of this, uh, they ended up, like, animating. Um, there's There was, like, over 900 shots in this film, and um, they were just, like, animating them at, like, uh, a pace of... Uh, well, really rapid pace in comparison to um, the last uh, projects at at Ghibli. So well, there I were suppose, some doubts if Yonabayashi uh, was going to finish it, but there was some uh, crunch. Yeah, there oh, was yeah. crunch time, exactly. but they made it happen. They did make it happen, but you know, it, it's it's rough because um, they had only one third of the shots finished four months before the cinematic release. Oof. True, That's but then, rough like, crunch. by the end of two months, by the end of two months, they had like, uh, I think, or well, before, they were more than like two thirds of the way done yeah. after That's two true. months more. So they they ramped it up, indeed. But then you know, there's other workers down the pipeline. There's uh, the 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 voice yeah. acting. There's the, the music. Voicing. There's the editing. There's the coloring. All of that stuff. Like the animation yep. cuts aren't immediately colored. You know, that it's all sorts Correct. of stuff. It's it's an insane. It's. I, I think it's an insane turnaround considering how many Ghibli movies, or I guess how habitually Ghibli movies run late, much to Suzuki's demise. Uh, <laughs> and mm. this one did yes. not run late. This one did not yeah. run late. Yonabayashi stuck to his guns, uh, kept the date. Suzuki was pleased. Suzuki was pleased. Yonabayashi was really overwhelmed. It was also, <laughs> I mean, it's the first time the man has ever ri written a storyboard, right? He, he didn't yeah. even direct a single episode or segment of a movie or series or anything before. Just the yeah, key no. animator. And then here, please draw an entire Take a storyboard. <laughs> and here, here's a little anecdote too, yeah. like, because Yonabayashi basically explained, okay, I accept it because I thought they would stop me if it would end up bad. And then Miyazaki refused to look over his storyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he's like sink or swim. You know, <laughs> he, he, yeah, you know Yonabayashi was like looking at, at Miyazaki as if like Miyazaki was like the lifeguard that would like, you know, if he started drowning, Miyazaki would come to the rescue. No, Miyazaki, he, 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 left, he left the lifeguard stand a long time ago. He's All like, right, nah. yeah. Miyazaki and, uh, but, but just in, uh, wrote the screenplay together with a uh, 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 colleague, uh, Keiko Niwa, uh, who also wrote the screenplay to Ocean Waves, Tales from Earth Sea, from Up and Poppy Hill later, when Mani was there, and Eric and the Witch. So she's like one of the, I guess, newer generation of Ghibli writers, except Ocean yeah. Waves, which uh, she, is pretty old. Uh, just a quick fun fact I stumbled upon. She also wrote the uh, uh, the Kabuki play adaptation of Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. In t from 2019, which is a beautiful thing that 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 this exists. 
But yes. she seems to be the one one of the younger staff members they passed the torch to. Because remember, Ocean Waves was as a movie back when we covered that, intentionally meant to give more um you know, be a training grounds training for, grounds for, for newer... younger Ghibli stuffers, right? And now with mm. all these newer movies, Tales from Earth, Up on Poppy Hill, When Marnie Was There, Eric and the Witch, like basically all the newer Ghibli movies that aren't the big Miyazaki Takahata movies, she's there doing them. Mm. And, yeah. th- and that, that's, as, as yeah. One of the, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but that's also like just, just a, a shout out to y- Yonobayashi, like getting things done on time because like, as as consumers of uh, of movies, like we're we're mostly like not very concerned about the the production end of things, but like when you're like in the heat of things, you definitely absolutely want to work together with someone who can get things done on time on budget, like that's that that's a very valuable thing, uh, like I- 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 even if like. Even if some corners are cut, like a finished product on time is more valuable than a perfect product in three years, you know. And and yeah. it's also, you could tell, I watched another interview uh, with Yonobayashi. Know, it was also before release and Yonobayashi know, was very excitedly showing the camera some con- concept art they had and some backgrounds and explaining what would happen in the movie and what his, what he thinks the appeal is. And he was so very proud of everything there. And he pointed at Arietti's character and was like, when we put the, 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 the clothespin into her hair and we knew she would have a ponytail tucked back by a clothespin, then I knew this would be a good movie. Which, yes. <laughs> which, by the way, <laughs> Miyazaki like, that, hated that comment so much. Like the uh, interview with Miyazaki, where he was grumpy, was immediately afterwards. He's like, "What? What a prick! He imagines this movie will be great because of a clothespin. Finish it first before talking big." It's like, "Oh my god, Miyazaki, <laughs> calm down." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that kind of goes into um, how. <laughs> yeah, I mean Miyazaki. I mean. He let somebody else pilot his plane, you know, his nice shiny red plane. Yeah, and with, and he with doesn't a, he doesn't take motor. to that well. So um but uh no Suzuki and Miyazaki both tried to keep um Yonobayashi from like appearing publicly to do interviews like um Oh yeah. And I think Yonobayashi also, you know, declined to do that out of his own will. Simply because, you know, as his first um, directing um, debut and also at such a high-profile place as Studio Ghibli, like, he would be really heavily scrutinized if the film were to be a failure. Um, Whether that means that it, you know, just turns out to be a bad film or if the production just folds, you know. This turns out to be such a theme so quickly between these newer Ghibli movies by different directors. mm. Like, all of them are trembling in fear to live up to Miyazaki. Goro Miyazaki, yeah. maybe most of all, and as we've discussed during the Earth Sleep podcast, but holy fuck, like, Yonobayashi wasn't in an easy position, and Miyazaki, you know, even in that grumpy interview said, yeah, it's better to have him less in front of the camera. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's, it's pretty um, it's, it's pretty on the nose, but, but I, th- I think it, it actually so points nice. to... Uh, but, but yeah, like... Yeah, by all accounts, Yonobayashi is just just an absolutely like delightful person uh, to be around. Yeah, he was glowing. Um, he was pleasant. Yeah. Everyone in the yeah, it, but, it but, said but, that but, everyone but in the studio loves him. You know. Yeah, but but I, I think it also like uh, points to something about the movie, which is like it, there there definitely is that like that joy and pride in like the animation. Like like, like what absolutely. what really stands out is I- exactly that that shot where she puts on the the hairpin uh, up in mm. a ponytail. It's just there's so much appeal there. There's, uh, there, there's such such a sense of yeah. like life there that, that like really is, is like what, like just one of the strongest. Generally, what genuinely one of the strongest parts of the movie is like just that one like character design detail, which uh, totally. But but, but at and the same because- time, like it also it also like unlike uh, it, it, it's also like unlike Miyazaki, there isn't like that level of like perfectionism and striving and like great great ambition for something you know yearning for something greater it feels like this movie feels somewhat content to be itself which definitely uh, it's it's a little bit smaller in scope and like it's a good thing in some ways and like in other ways it just yeah 
it, it, it sometimes it can feel like it, it is lacking that like that X factor that uh, that Miyazaki's films have. Well, sure, and I think, but but you know, I, I don't think that that makes this film a lesser film. I think this film is actually a really really well done film. It's just being under the you know Studio Ghibli name, it's going to uh, you know. Uh, induce these comparisons and uh, which are always ultimately going to be unfair to anybody being compared to Miyazaki. Like, yes. yes. Miyazaki so, movies just feel really, really big usually. Like they aren't like quiet. They are big usually. Like except maybe Totoro, yes. I guess. But even no, that... But Totoro is, uh, is a titan of yeah. the animation like Indeed. of J- Japanese animation. But I mean, even, even in terms of scope, yeah. they feel big. Big, whereas, and no pun intended, this movie is small. Like it is a very yeah. confined location. Not a, not many places we go. Not many characters we see. No world changing events except for the tiny people we normally wouldn't see in our everyday life. You know, <laughs> exactly. And it's like this uh, this t- the smallness. I mean, it, I actually feel it's like a very compelling explanation as to why I don't see this film talked about very often, um, because. In the Ghibli oeuvre, it like really is just this small, nice little movie that yeah. is overshadowed by everyone around it. It's like the opposite totally. of standing on the shoulders of giants. It's like standing on his own two feet, but really tiny between those giants. Not to diminish what the movie does and is. I really like it, but it's just interesting how this ends up being how we see one of the movies by such an amazingly great, renowned, internationally famous studio with basically no attention for this movie. Yeah. You know, in, in a way, it, it kind of like reminds me of the image of those, you know, those videos on YouTube. You can see where it's like comparing like the size of like, um, like the, the size of like the, the largest space stations in fiction and like yeah. it keeps on zooming out <laughs> and, and you eventually get to these space stations that are like world sized uh, from like Warhammer or something. And like, and you, and it just, you, you think the one thing is like really big and then it just gets dwarfed by the next thing. Right. So it's like in a way, like the, the, you know, Miyazaki's films are like the death star and like, you know, the little nice, you know, well-functioning space station that Yonobayashi built is like, you know, <laughs> that's a really, it, that's a really, really specific <laughs> image. Thank you. I'm sorry, it just really. I, I, know, I will, have to, me of those kind I will of have to correct you though. Uh, in that case, Spirited Away is the Gurren Lagan. Oh yeah. Okay. Galaxy size. That's <laughs> yeah, true. But it, it, having said all that, what I mean by this film being tiny and not often you know, covered, isn't to say it wasn't a box office success. Indeed, it was. It was very successful. I think it Pop was... Pop grossing the, film in Japan, yeah. Yeah, I think the that largest year. opening ever for a Ghibli film in the first week. And it more than doubled Ponyo's opening week. So it's, it's a massive wow. margin between the two opening weeks. So the movie wasn't financially unsuccessful. I'm just gen- generally... I mean, I guess, uh, so we come at this from a different perspective than most people would. Like, most people would watch the films and, you know, like, oh, there's a Ghibli movie, nice. We come at the pers- at this with a perspective of having to then go and see what have other people said about this movie? What types of writing is there? Is there academic yeah. discourse? Is there, like, cool blog posts we can pull from? YouTube videos? First of all, I, I, I don't think there were any, like, analysis essays on Arietti on YouTube. Not A1. Not, not one. Um, blog posts, very rarely, a, f- a few of them made a couple of points, but nothing that I think uh, uh, we, we would end up putting into the sources of this video because of, you know, it's not going super deep into this film, it's not doing much with it, and that's very unlike many of the bigger films covered. And right. before, I always had the suspicion, you know, stuff like, even Ocean Waves had more coverage, you know? Um, but before I always, <clears throat> like, had returns, I had the idea, well, not a lot of things can be sad about this film. I think we we said a few things yeah. in our podcast on it, so no no shitting on Cat Returns. But um, there and, and I stood it, but I felt like Arietti has so much more going on than people really talk about, and that's what kind of definitely yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. got me yeah. off guard. I say I'll, I'll well, say. Well, one thing that like this got got me thinking about like, this <clears throat> this question uh, kind of of authorship of uh, of Arietti because like discussing it as a 
Yonabayashi film, like we, we, we can definitely tell for uh, like that the, there is this animator's you know soul in the like in the definitely. whole making of, of, of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at the same time, I, I, I'm wondering like if Miyazaki had ended up directing this, since like it was like a, pa- a long time passion project for him, and he he wrote the screenplay. Would it have added? something through through his his direction through through the small changes he might make the the decisions he would make in the storyboarding would that add that little x factor that 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 is present in something slight and small like totoro to make it like transcendent in some way it's, that's it's, a lot, like i don't yeah. think we're, we're ever going to get an answer to that <laughs> that's hard uh, to answer but yeah. i think uh, yeah. In the same vein as there might be something else if Miyazaki directed it, there would also be something lost if Yonobayashi didn't direct it, because Yonobayashi, um, yeah, like I that guess, hair clip, that hair clip, <laughs> Miyazaki did not like that apparently. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> but you know, as a little bit of a of context for Yonobayashi's later career, we will cover it more during the podcast. So for one, he will later go on to direct when Mani was there, which is in 2014. The last Ghibli movie before the long, long, long break between Imani and uh, um, Earwake and the Witch in 2020, um, which is a really, really fascinating movie. And this, and when Yonabayashi later left Studio Ghibli to form Studio Ponok, where he later made Mary and the Witch's Flower in 2017, which is a movie that clearly looks like it's a Ghibli movie. Like, it's clearly, like, taking pages out of the book of Ghibli. It has, I think, even Ghibli staffers went along with Yonobayashi to Studio Ponok. We will cover yeah. the story of Studio Ponok later on down the line. I think we should... Maybe we should absolutely, actually do absolutely. Mary and it, the it Witch's Flower like, immediately after when Mario yes, was Studio there. Studio Ponok is, is, is like the the, uh, uh, the, the, the the skeleton of, uh, of, of the Ghibli staff, like that... Uh, jumped over there and like uh just mary and the witch's flower is in my opinion it straddles the line between loving homage and uh cheap copy um but we'll 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 get to that eventually uh, i i believe because it it is so much in the lineage of ghibli but what i was going to say is that between those three movies that we've gotten directed from yonabayashi his voice does emerge um i find it really hard to like qualify exactly what it is that differentiates him um what distinguishes him but when i look at like his his female protagonists i feel it very strongly that arietti the way she is is not a miyazaki girl hmm hmm but she's a ghibli girl because it is still you know yeah yeah would you would you can you can you elaborate on that i feel like she has more teenage angst yeah. Okay. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that yes. totally tracks. Yes. I was actually, you know, when we get into our character discussion later, like Arietti's, you know, it's she. It's said that she's like about to turn fourteen, so she's in this really, you know, uh, uh, like point in her life that she's, you know, redefining herself. She has like this coming of age um, uh, ritual or 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 like rite of passage of her first borrowing and um, it doesn't go well. And she's, she's always getting into fights with her mom. You know, she's like, she like preemptively knows what her mom is going to nag her about. So she's like, no, she did. He didn't see me mom. Like, (laughs) (laughs) but (laughs) she does have this teenage angst. You're right. This is, I think. So when we talk about the regular Miyazaki girl, she always has principles and she's, I guess, like a guiding beacon to people around her. Miyazaki consciously She's, writes motherly. them like this. They, they can be motherly. And sometimes if they have insecurities like Kiki, those manifest very differently than angst, let's say. Um, even yes. though Kiki has some angst. Maybe the, the, the best example of an a angsty Miyazaki character would be Kiki. But even that is low-key compared to, I think, Arietti Or the, uh, I forgot her name, but the protagonist of When Mani Was There. Because, you know, those movies Anna. explore... Yeah, right. Thanks. Uh, explore, and you know they have principles. They have a worldview. They have a vision of of a different world, but with an edge, like not just the mm-hmm. upbeat principledness uh, of the starry you know eyed Actually, future forward. You know, I I think I think that there's the these characters of Yonobayashi's, um, these these female protagonists. They are on the edge of a disillusionment, whereas like. Miyazaki's girls are a little bit more strong in their ideologies. Like they're a little bit more mature in their ideologies. Of uh, the Yonabayashi's uh, girls are they they are a little bit hazy. They're not quite 
they don't have sure footing, right? They don't know what to believe quite yet. Right. Both um, Arietti and Anna are in an identity crisis all throughout their mm-hmm. respective movie. As well as Mary in Mary and yeah. the Lushisar. They They are yeah. constantly asking the question, okay, who am I? Do I belong in this society? Yes. Where could I belong? Whatever, you know? In Arietti, like, Arietti is coded as a very liminal character. She constructs a connection to the boy in the house show. She is the one who constantly goes exploring and breaks out of her confines. But also when she's faced with a potential loss of her home, she is extremely affected and she doesn't want to leave. She wants to somehow mend the situation, fix the thing. And it's like her identity, her position in the world is constantly unstable. And that is, I don't think that is a thing that Miyazaki uh, 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 girls often do. Yeah. Right. There, there, I think you're there's right. There's also yeah. There's, there's also the way that like the whole story is like Arietti, you know, she fucks up, and they have to leave, and they and they do that. Like the, the, yeah. that's not like it's, she also, it's not something she really fixes. You know, she yeah. just like makes a mistake, and that's like they they have they have and to, they have to with deal that. with the consequences. Yeah, yeah. but um. You know, before we get too deep into the character discussion, I also think that the the this property of like this instability to the characters lends itself very well to a like to visual conveyance with Yonobayashi's style. Like his his style as a director is to always focus on the dynamic movement that's going on in the scene. And oh, oh yeah. boy, is there so many shots of dynamic movement in this movie like the the lift the makeshift lift that uh you know uh arietti and her dad use when they go on her first borrowing Uh, going up through the walls yes going up through the walls like that is just so uh this it's such a rush there and and like you said that the you know something as simple as her putting on a clip and then you know moving her ponytail back and forth to look at herself in the mirror um, to you know the the cat chasing her into the drain and and like swiping at her with with the claws like there's always this really dynamic movement the crickets the right. all the different bugs in there yeah. like it's it's really incredible and by also, contrast, outfits, like this, right like she transforms yeah. visually throughout the film yeah yeah it's really great um I think it's it's yeah. it's not only like uh, d- d- dynamism and kin- kineticism that that's the secret like this. There's such a respect for the weight of movement in in the whole movie, which is especially essential in that it is all about these really small, uh, like, characters moving around in their world and and, and the, quote-unquote, bigger, you know, human-sized characters moving around in theirs and the way that those two interact. Yeah, it's really important for the... But, like... When when you, when you talk about that lift uh, going up, like like obviously like the the, the shots of, of it like whooshing up is is just really good, but like the way in which uh, in which the uh, the, the father apart like like posed on the on on the thread like yeah. like it's really a there. there yeah yeah, yeah, yeah totally exactly. and and the and the way when, when the backpack he has and, and there's that little mm-hmm. uh, little tape that that holds it it on and and it's like extra sticky because they're so small so, so it has oh, yeah. to be pulled a bit more and, yeah. and just the it's way the that double-sided tape yeah, yeah, yeah. But the way he, he has to pull a bit on it and the way it opens and the way like the the cloth just moves around as, as these different things jostle inside it that's like i think the the key ingredient to like making the animation in Arietti so satisfying which makes it so such a perfect movie for an animator to direct right um yes. because this movie in terms of its visuals it is all about weight. It is all about those big, monstrously large humans and cats and all of that stuff, and these tiny people living in the in the in the in the floors, in the basement, and, and whatever in the rubble. And like, you have to think about camera in such a different way when you are supposed to make the mundane, the everyday, look ginormous and you tiny mm-hmm. compared to it. It's like, I think it's really challenging, but also like Yonobayashi did a great job like they just like imagine this like they just picked up someone who was super happy being a key animator all his life and said you direct this really visually complicated and hard to do movie about tiny people where you have to nail all these aspects to make the viewer actually experience the feeling of being tiny as compared to like giants and that sense you know it, it like nails the thing like Shadows of Colossus also nails this like when something is really huge and you're supposed to feel its weight and stomping and everything and it's like, great job. Like, holy shit, you know, Ashi, you did it. <laughs> yeah. 
And whoever whoever did, did the sound design also contributed enormously, massively. like oh yeah, massively because the uh, there there's like a couple scenes that are really do it for me. Um, one of them is when Arietti first like enters the the kitchen, yeah, and sees how huge it is, and she remarks, "Like everything is so massive," and there's all these sounds of the kitchen and they're imagined they're they're in Arietti's head like they're not actually going on because it's the dead of night no movement is going on but she can imagine like the weight and the reverberation and the rumbling of all of these kitchen noises at the scale of the humans and it's just like it's, it's just a long shot of just you know looking at these dim kitchen appliances and and you know utensils and stuff and hearing these sounds um and so like because there really isn't any animation in those scenes the sound design really like takes the center stage um and just really uh gives a scope you know that that relativism that uh gives um yeah um, makes makes the viewer like be at that level of the the borrowers. Right, so, so a, a quick scouring of the internet. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the person in charge of sound for the movie is, is uh, Koji Kazamatsu, who it seems is also was also in charge of uh, Tales from Earthsea and uh, The Wind Rises. Very cool. Uh, the other scene yeah. that is wonderfully directed when it comes to sound is um, is the scene in the in Show's bedroom when they're getting the tissue and you can hear the grandfather clock ticking and it's just this massive oh, it's just tick. Ma- yeah, yeah. And yeah, then it's, it's when, a huge beast sleeping. Yeah, it, yeah. And then there's this beast sleeping, but there's also there's this, this huge human mechanism, this, you know, mechanical contraption just reverberating through the entire room. And, but when Arietti sees show is awake and looking at her, That's all like of a sudden her heartbeat, her heartbeat, reaches the like overpowers the sound of the clock like her heartbeat takes a uh, you know uh supremacy to the sound of the clock just, like and just and her heartbeat matches the tempo of the clock as well and it's, it's good, just it's some good shit yeah that's really good yeah. because it's like it, it just makes it feel like oh wow like all of a sudden her fear is the central thing yeah. in her experience right now all the um, scene so when the sound she- design really contributes well to this movie. Or the scene when Sho tries to be nice and tries to bring the dollhouse kitchen into their their, you know, living yes. room basically. Yeah. And it's like and it's just this calamitous thing. She the, her straight. mom says like, "Oh, is this an earth earthquake?" That's fucking Gojira right there. That's a fucking monster movie. <laughs> he rips yeah. out the fucking roof and takes out the old kitchen and like puts the mom in a couch and it's like terrifying. It's loud. It's fucking exploding into your ears. Like the sound design is doing everything to tell you that this is a fucking yeah, disaster. But- but but at the same time with the animation, you can still tell that the things that are moving around are really small and don't weigh that much. Yeah, yeah. Like, like the, the way the, uh, the 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 stuff in the kitchen like clutters around. Like it's not like an actual like life size kitchen where where things like a, a cup falling over would just like fall down and crash. No, it, it's just a little thing that just topples over a little bit. And, and it jumps and and break around. under yeah. its own weight. And yeah, I think exactly. it's such an yeah. interesting thing. I will not go into this now. We will go into this later. But I think it's thematically such a powerful thing to utilize this te- technique of defamiliarization to comment on yes. the monstrously large humans, to comment on the monstrously oversized house and kitchen and you know household appliances and all of that. And yes. defamiliarizing us with them really puts us into a position to see the kind of interior design, interior decoration, the house is going for, what that means for its residents. But before we track completely into uh, themes, um, we we can talk a little bit about how the screenplay came to be. So because we know, yeah, Miyazaki has written it together with Niwa. And uh, the interesting sort of background here is that even though Miyazaki really was the one pitching uh, uh, the borrower, uh, the borrowers by Norton, he wrote the screenplay without rereading the novel, only relying on his memories. And I'd like to call into memory here what he basically said in Ponyo, uh, or in relation to Ponyo, what we also covered. How kind of there is always this 
unconscious, you know, popping the lid off of your brain and just grabbing into the unconscious when you start writing a story and all stories are composed of pieces of other stories. And like, the, what better illustration of Miyazaki literally just writing this thing from memory with all his, and this Suzuki explicitly comments on this, with all the things that Miyazaki misremembers or reinterprets or, or in hindsight gives importance to neg negligible details. Like, this is what Suzuki says about the writing process. Miyazaki just popped the lid off of his brain again and let it flow. Like, 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 a, yeah. like a mad man <laughs> like, like a master of his craft and then we basically have Niwa going over the script with him and trying to make sense but I, I hope you know in my <laughs> mind I imagine the process of like Miyazaki just spits out something extremely genius but like free form and free associative and someone needs to sit him down and help him turn that into a script <laughs> yeah exactly like okay yeah that's really nice hold on what are the character motivations and what is the motivation of this scene and he's like oh but it's 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 all about you know the, the being in touch with nature and it's like okay how do we express that let's let's go let's do this <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah and and, and yeah. then as to why he chose the story um miyazaki basically answered and i and i quote that the situation of the Karigorashi, the borrowers, is very pleasant. They fit into our present day. The age of mass consumption is now coming to an end, and the idea of borrowing proves to be an advent of it with the crisis. Uh, proves the advent of it with the crisis, right? Um, this film came out in 2010. This is just barely within the reach of the um, 2008 financial crash that affected the worldwide economy. And for Miyazaki, he saw the writing on the wall. He says, this is the end of the age of mass consumption. This is why he dig dug up the borrowers. Oh, no. The, little did he know that. Little you did know, he know. It is very sad. No one sad. would learn any lessons. Indeed. It is very sad. <laughs> Nobody learned any lessons. The world didn't change. Miyazaki said, this is the change uh, of the world. But I think this is really crucial for us going forward, also reading the film. But first of all, a little comparison, right? Um, in research, I dug up that the borrowers... In, in the 50s, in which it was written, of course, immediately after World War II, during the time when Britain was kind of recovering from World War II and building up whatever was destroyed during World War II. And uh, it, it is read often, in this case by A.N. Wilson, as in part an allegory of post-war Britain, with its picture of a diminished people living in an old, half-empty, decaying big house. We don't have much decay in the house in Miyazaki's writing or in Yonobayashi's directing. But I think what's interesting is that the original story is interpreted and read as a liminal story as of a time in which the world is changing. And yes. in this context, I think it's really important that the Miyazaki version not just locates the story from England to Japan while keeping the English house, but also, for example, in a very early scene, we see the lady of the house arriving in a Mercedes which has, by the way, the driver's seat on the left side, which means like a European continental car, not like the Japanese cars, which have the driver's seat on the right side. So it is a foreign car. Mm. We, have, mm. we have all this coding then of this mixture of the world and Japan, of global culture and Japanese culture, and this yeah. entirely Victorian-styled house in the middle of Japan as our setting. So clearly like the yeah, liminality the of the- garden and everything. Yeah. Yeah, so clearly the liminality of the original piece, as in the post-war British era, was kind of transplanted into the post-financial crash Japanese era, uh, with yeah, like yeah, the, yeah, and you obviously also have like the uh, the dollhouse is an import, you know, from a spe specialty shop in uh, in England, I think, or was it America? Right. I think it was England. It was England. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was England. And and I think that tells a really interesting story of a world that is divided in two between big and small in this case obviously for one the cosmopolitan rich elite that has like this this fancy house with so much luxury and on the other side a little people that is scrounging in the kind of remains left behind by those big peoples literally assembling their houses of junk out of what they can expend out of what they take and borrow from them so th this distinction obviously like is immediately a class divide in a way also a really... culture divide but you know i think it it is more along lines of class because of how we mm -hmm. understand um it is not that the global culture is demonized or anything it is just simply an expression of the what miyazaki says the age of mass consumption right 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think if if we think of it not only as a class divide, I definitely I think the class divide is is a very good uh, reading. Um, rather than there be a cultural divide, it's it's more of a um, the way I see the borrowers, I guess, in this film is this is a story about the, um, you know, humanity's like disconnect with living in harmony with nature because of the way, because of like consumerism. Um, oh, that's also good because but, the borrowers but are like the, recycling the, gods, right? They exactly. And, and, and they are, like like in nature they make use of everything right this this is a story of you know very much like uh princess mononoke it's it's the end of the uh it's the end of the fantasy that humans can go back to living like in this uh you know primitive community com, uh like primitive commune with nature there's this, you know, it's it's pulling back the uh, the veil on that disillusionment and saying like, hey, we can't really go back anymore. That's why the borrowers have to leave at the end. But this story is, I think, interestingly uh, put into the perspective of these little spirits of nature, right? The, and, it, and it humanizes their side, which of course, you know, the spirits of nature is just entirely metaphorical, but if they were humanized, this is what the, it would look like, right? Uh, hold yeah. on, real take. Is this a sequel to Pompoco? You know, um, it, it might just be, but I, I can't really say. I know that um, uh, and Endless Anui, when I w watched this movie with her, she said that she was getting a lot of Pompoco vibes from it, but I actually haven't seen Pompoco. Oh, oh no! I, I, I think the mo I think the most uh, Pompoco vibe of it is actually the ending, in which uh, th there's not really a like a synthesis or anything. Like th the right. the nature loving characters just have ha have to move on. Like there's there's not really a like clear solution to it. To it everything. ends with right. the Which, same kind yeah. of hope. Sorry, voice, for spoiling this, but the, the podcast listeners no, have no, heard no, it's it okay. all. <laughs> they're, they're like, like in, in the end of Pompoko, we have a small remainder of hope. Like the feeling that, yes, the Tanuki yes. culture is kind of destroyed, but they still live among us. And they are tired office workers, but when they get home, you know, after having drunk all these energy drinks, they sometimes meet in parks and they sing together again. And it's like the idea that something of that life isn't lost, but continues to live on. And that is what we have and what we should cherish in a way yeah, and I it, feel it like exists in in our memories yeah and it exists in uh you know our art and expression and in our way of life and and the, the interesting thing about i guess we're jumping straight into the ending whatever you know well we are thing, but like yeah oh, it's, it's, just, not, it's don't, totally don't fine mind. totally fine stream of consciousness not, works yeah, out perfectly let's go let's go the borrowers leaving kind of feels like laputa that has to fly away it's not that yeah. there's no future of reconciling between humans and borrowers but it's definitely true that there's no connection now but show yeah. has gained a perspective on life by knowing yes. that they exist, like a new perspective on life, a new faith in life, a, a confidence that he will survive his heart surgery. It literally saves his life. It literally yeah. saves his yeah. spirit before the operation. We don't know. Oh, yeah, like, his soul. Yeah, but, but the idea is like these creatures that have these beautiful lives, which, which they like borrow things. I read this as like yeah. a different economic practice as compared to cons uh, mass consumption. Miyazaki agrees probably because borrowing is such a perfect expression of solidarity of like making use of, uh, instead of overproducing, making use of what is there, recycling, all of it. Uh, uh, um. And the idea of this lifestyle being celebrated, cherished, and that it will survive despite what the world is like, that this is the hopeful moment of the movie. And, you know, yes, Miyazaki also said that he thinks the purpose of this film should be to comfort and encourage people who live in this chaotic and varying time. And I think... That's that's also what I'm getting from this movie. So that that is a success in that regard. Yeah. Well, I I, I don't know. I, I still think that like, uh, I I think when you mentioned that Yonobiashi had that thought that oh well, directors should have like something they want to say with it, and I don't. Like I I I think that 
still kind of like you can still kind of feel that like kind of absence in in in, in the movie because like there's not there's not the same I don't know that there's there's just not, not the same soulfulness to the messaging of the movie as there is to like the details of it. Well, it's important that Yonobayashi said this before he accepted the project, so before he read mm. the book, before yes. he started working on the storyboard. I, I think afterwards he, did find he changed because I, I I can't I couldn't disagree with you more. Play. I think I think the mm. way that Yonobayashi communicates is much less heavy handed than Miyazaki. But that doesn't mean that it's not there, that there isn't a vision, that there isn't a an ideology and a philosophy present in in the film. It is it communicated like with as much richness as it might be in a Miyazaki movie? Maybe not, but I do think that it is there. I do think that it does have a spark to it. I, I definitely agree. I need I needed a few rewatches to see more in this film than just, you know, it's this cool adventure film about little people and just really see more in it. And I think this this time, this research, this thinking about the film brought me really around to seeing the vision. I mean, I, mean, I guess it helps, uh, Platon, I think before the cast we talked about that you hadn't seen when Marnie was there, which is a beautiful and brilliant film. It probably really helps to be a bit like familiar with what you know, with how Yonobayashi works and it probably also helps to you know I guess maybe this is fair to say but to have a, a faith in him that he can do a really insightful beautiful well-crafted soulful movie I feel like especially because the Ghibli name is attached and we've talked about this before but like, I think we're all ourselves also kind of prone to to this problem that it is Ghibli and there's a new director, so there will be added scrutiny, like automatically. Exactly. Yeah, but yeah, well, I mean, here, here I, I am we, scrutinizing anyway. <laughs> that's, it's okay. That's totally fine. <laughs> it's, it's good. It, I think now that we're talking about, you know, where where is the philosophy in this movie? Um, I think that leads well into, you know, how. We, we should talk about that and how Yonobayashi communicates that through his directing. And I think you, Nyard, had a lot to say about the the setting as how that expresses aspects of this uh, philosophy. The music is notably from a Western, um, uh, you know, composer who was a fan of Ghibli and sent her um, uh, recordings to them in a bid to try to see if she could maybe work with them in the future. This is uh, the composer's uh, Cecile Corbel. Um, and she's one a of the, fr French Celtic, right? Uh, uh, Breton, right? Yeah. Br yeah, but, but Breton is like the. Uh... That's the Celts, right? Yeah, that that's that's a region in France which has like I think a Celtic ethnic group in it, like right, a very right, explicitly right. Celtic. Yeah. There, so the music is really characterized by this sort of it's 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 sort of folkish and um, it has a lot of acoustic guitar and uh, dulcimer harp. and and harp and air like uh, vocals and. Um, it has this very, you know, European, um, like, sort of, a sort of, uh, like, fairy tale like, uh, you know, um, aesthetic to it, I think that it calls. Yeah, definitely. And I really like how this creates this uh, synergy of, of, you know, uh, the Japanese setting as representative of like modernism and consumerism in this movie and then this more western fairy tale aesthetic as representative of a more you know uh natural spiritualism and like you know a a, a way to to live in harmony with nature a way to uh, as as opposed to the consumerism you know repurposing yeah. items and things like that and that so the, the the fact that the movie from the ground up has these different parts of its production coming from you know Europe and Jap and Japan, um, I think really synergizes well. You know what I like about this especially, but to because it kind of rejects nationalism as a as a spiritual origin because the Japanese society mm -hmm. is 
for one thing, like not, I don't want to say corrupted, but definitely changed and influenced by consumerism, by the Mercedes, by like the Victorian house. But at the same time, the spiritualist cult counterpoint is not like Japanese uh, yokai. It is um, little, you know, British novel Western fairies, yeah, fairies yeah, basically, and uh, French Celtic music uh, associated yes. with. It. So it's not like mm. you could easily slip into the trap where you depict like the antagonism between the cosmopolitan big house and consumerism versus you know the real yeah, Japanese so folklore. But no, they they avoid that trap so perfectly just by having the little people, the downtrodden, the uh, uh, rejection of the consumerism also be international or global we could say because they have english names which are really you know not japanese names which is kind of weird that the uh british dub changes the japanese house uh, uh people living in the house to 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 english names because i think that takes yeah, away you, 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 a little bit yeah you miss out on some yeah you miss out stuff there so it's like both sides are global we're not stepping away from globalism we're not stepping away from international worlds what we're doing yeah. is we're kind of trying to construct a rejection of the globalist, capitalist, consumerist way of uh, framing a world into right. a different world where I think maybe uh, maybe I'm excused for saying this in such a, a, a flowery way, but we're stepping into the realm of like being connected through stories, through mythology, through beauty and music from around the world. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and you are, the word here is connected right yeah. because show it comes from like his illness is subtextually um a result of the alienation of capitalist society you know his his you know yeah his mom can't be there for his surgery she's working yeah because she's yeah. working exactly that that takes precedence this material gain takes precedence over uh shows you know, being with show in his time of, you know, uh, in this crisis, yeah. right? Um, and it's sort of this, you know, there's this purposelessness to that show is kind of stuck in at the beginning of the film. And doomerism. And species doomerism. have been oh, wiped out. Yeah, doomer, yeah. yeah absolutely. She's, yeah, he, we'll he, we'll, you know, we'll he, get to that conversation. Yeah, just, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, then one last note on the music, which is, I just really love the story that uh, Cecile Corbel was a fan of Ghibli movies and thought, well, I made this album, so I guess I'll send it to Japan to see if they like it. And uh, Toshio Suzuki commented that he already in pre-production thought he wanted a Celtic score for this movie. And That's less so than cool. 10 days later or something, like <laughs> the, 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 oh. the fucking mail came and he... Suzuki noticed her envelope because it was handwritten. And I, I don't wow. know, this, this is so authentic. The idea that this is a yes. handwritten letter to us with a CD from her, who is our fan. And then later, immediately, here's an email, please work with us. <laughs> and this is beautiful. Imagine you're a fan of Ghibli and you're like also a musician. And you send them a sample of your music uh. and they come back to you and say, yep, you're on. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You know, that no, absolutely mind blowing. Like that's, I would, that's I would, a fairy tale of its own. You know, it is. However, since we're, you know, this is another area of the film that can be unfavorably compared to other Ghibli works because, mm. and this this goes again with the scope. You know, the the score of this film it's very simple. It's it's it it re reuses the same themes multiple times with slightly different instrumentation, maybe some different tempos um, to, for, to suit the different scenes. But, um, you know, it's a very, it's a very simple score with a sort of, you know, uh, like you said, as a French Celtic uh, folk style to it. It's not grandiose. It's not orchestral, you know, which is what I think com contributes so much to the, bigness that you feel in Miyazaki films because they're always accompanied with Joe Hisaishi scores. Um, right. It, I definitely, also, as a, yeah. my first time seeing the movie, having associated Ghibli films with Hisaishi's music, I was a bit disappointed with the score of this film. 
that was a long time ago. And I now have since come to appreciate the nuances uh, and character of a more simple, you know, folk style of music and even, you know, scores of, you know, uh, films that are not uh, completely, um, I guess, uh, th- not completely... Um, grandiose? Yeah, grandiose. Uh, and uh, I, I think what this score does is really, it's perfect for this film. It, it feels very, really, really mm. intimate. I have one issue. Yes. And that is they overuse the main theme. Yes. And yes, that, I was about uh, to say, like, it, and it's, it's not just that they use it several times. It's that, like, I, sometimes in throughout the movie, I think the music put, like, starts out, like, or, or is put in 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 places where you d- you don't need them or they don't really fit the tone. Especially, maybe. like, especially the beginning of the movie, the, uh, the the song, like, and I don't think it's just because it's like it has English lyrics that like d- d- distract, but just the the tone of it, the, the, this like the, the, this like grand intimate um, like nostalgic thing is like swelling as he arrives at this place where like the character himself show is not really excited or nostalgic at the moment. Oh no, no, like, like it, it, it exactly doesn't fit his the mood. Point. No, and, it does because and he's the, immediately no, enchanted by the environment. Like his his no no no. As soon as he gets enchanted by the environment, as soon as he gets out, and we see that gorgeous, gorgeous background, like, like, like a panning shot of the whole garden. That's when the music stops. The music stops at, at, at that point. I, I just I just think there's a mitch, mismatch there, honestly. So and I, and I think like there yeah. are several times throughout the movie where this music kicks in that doesn't exactly fit with the mood of what is going on in that moment. I really only noticed when in the midpoint they reused the main theme once again with lyrics during the movie while other characters were talking. And I was a bit put off by that. Don't get me wrong, it's a beautiful song. And I think I personally liked how they used it in the beginning. It like really opened the movie on a strong note, immediately putting you into the mood and immediately it is more for the audience than to represent show's internality. It is really like you get something and this is also a thing Miyazaki likes to do and I think Yonabayashi tried a very similar thing here it is to get the viewer nostalgically invested in what is on screen so yeah. to evoke images familiar and unfamiliar and I, I don't know I, I, I just think that like it, it it goes really hard right at the start like like if, if you compare it to, to a similar opening like uh, like Spirited Away I know it's unfair but like we again have a, a, a car drive with a character who's like kind of like apathetic at that point, but but like the, the the score still hits this like nostalgic vibe without going overboard. So so it has to like feel like this is the big moment. Like imagine if like it, it had been like a quieter theme at the start, and then the uh, like the main theme like really kicks in full blast. Maybe in like one of his meetings with Arietti or something like that. Some one moment where this like this beauty of the moment hits him instead. I, 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 I definitely I just feel like it's it's mis- mismatched. That I point. definitely see the point, especially when we reuse the the theme, including lyrics, three times throughout the movie. I feel like you're right. There's a little bit of variation in, in, in the sense of how it develops into the scene would have been appreciated because really yeah. the music is great it's just i think the yeah, the, the use of music hams it up sometimes and, and it's I, like, I suspect yeah. i suspect that like the production history is part of that like them having like things finished like just in time that doesn't leave a lot of time for like the music to really be tailor-made to how the scenes like play out and feel I, it's I, I, true. I think they that have, might have been part yeah. of it. It's so true because, you know, you barely have any time to go into that, yeah. composing new yeah. tracks or making new arrangements when you have barely two months left to finish a movie. Yeah. Um, you know... Yeah, I, good, good music. I just, like... Uh, sure. Yeah. I, th- I I would agree, actually, that there are some points where it's a bit awkward. Uh, it, it somewhat takes, you know, me out of the, out of this, the, the scene... The beginning wasn't one of those moments for me, but definitely I think the second time it comes in in the middle of the film was odd. Um, 
and and I, I noted that mentally. I think at the end of the film, you know, that it comes back is very appropriate there. But uh, uh, but yeah, I think there maybe is, like Nyard said, a bit of hamming it up uh, yeah. well, with with that with those tracks. Well, luckily, uh, we have a whole like rest of the movie to like uh, pull the weight, and especially the the animation and and the backgrounds do a lot of of the work Definitely. to like yeah really hit those like the, 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 that's the thing like the animation and the details and the backgrounds like have such su- such loving care and subtlety that uh, that that might be like what that might be why the like big swelling main theme feels so hammy because like it it, it contrasts mm-hmm. against that like that charm yeah. yeah but i do think that still the yeah. the style of the music goes a long way i because i don't know the just having it not be orchestral in a way is kind of more intimate uh than than we're used to in at least a Ghibli film. But yeah, I think that there is perhaps, it's not necessarily the character of the music that's off, just the timing of when it was used. Like what what yeah, cuts yeah. Were, was it placed with, you know? Indeed. Was a little bit off and a little bit awkward. But I totally excuse that. I, for one, really approve of the decision to try out a different style of music. Like, yeah, yeah. When when do you have a Ghibli movie that does not have the big booming orchestral soundtrack? It's rare. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the, all the, the, all the ones that ca- aren't doesn't Kaguya also music. like like pull back a bit and and go for the yeah. traditional uh, Japanese? I sound? just said it's rare. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I will say this: Hisaishi only Hisaishi has only worked on Hayao Miyazaki films at Studio Ghibli. Like he's not collaborated with any other director there. So like, didn't didn't like like I said, uh, isn't Kaguya Isn't that uh, Joe Hisaishi? Oh wait. Oh, is that the wait? Um, now I actually you might have caught me uh, fibbing. So oh no no no. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's well, music on, by uh, Joe Hisaishi. I looked it up. Well, I guess I guess Hisaishi was convinced uh, but, but yes. even then in Takahata's <laughs> vision for that one it is okay. not just Joe Hisaishi who composes orchestral soundtracks for uh, Ghibli movies true like yeah. we also no, have uh, a Tales from SD which had a pretty big soundtrack um, that's not Joe Hisaishi but you know still still really good yeah mm, indeed good soundtrack in that movie yeah, so we've returned from a break uh, in the Nausicaa so where we nail segues and always catch the transition opportunities that our fellow cast members provide for us. To, and we did the break to grab hot chocolate, at least I did. And now we I return. I beer. <laughs> That's beautiful. So there's the difference between us, which is usually inverted, funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> where you drink soda, soda, and I drink beer. Whatever. Um, well, as, as we established, I'm, 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 I'm just a, a really little creature, so I, I only need a few drops uh, of, of beer with me. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, and I only, it's not that bad. I only have half a cup of hot chocolate because my machine only gives me half a cup, so that's unfortunate. Anyways. And it's morning where I live, so I'm drinking coffee. Powerful. Yeah. Uh, d- d- donate to our Patreon so that uh, Nyard can get a, b- a better hot coffee machine, <laughs> hot, 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 hot cocoa machine. So that I can afford to make myself a full cup of hot, hot chocolate? Yes. I don't know. Is that is that living in excess? Oh. <laughs> so yeah, we Damn. all grew up yeah. in consumer cultures in which we can fill our houses with such luxuries such as uh, hot coffee and hot coffee, stuff. hot chocolate making machines and stuff. I have so much stuff around me. Did I tell you I have six pairs of headphones for some reason? Yeah, um, I live in excess. I am a disgusting creature because you know what would happen if... I, honestly, you know what? I need to take one step back, which is I am partially there to where the borrowers are. So let, let's just illustrate this, right? If the borrowers wanted headphones, first of all, they would probably grab some old in-ears that were lying around somewhere and they would pry them open to get like these huge like drivers out of them, like little in-ear monitor headphones. And these drivers, they could fashion into like really big studio headphones for themselves and they would do it. And you know what they would do if it would break? They would repair it. 
and then they would repair it again. And if it broke again, maybe they would have to see if they could scavenge another pair of headphones. Just to illustrate how decadent I am and how lovely and recycling and DIY and reusing they are. Um, you can actually see that in action with the father uh, of the family actually having a little forge going. Yeah. Just oh, yeah, that, that, so he can do some little him, soldering, like, right? Like he's, yeah, he's, he's soldering. Soldering. <laughs> soldering, yeah, soldering. Yeah, the, the the way the the metal like melts together, and it's and because he's so small, it's like it's so big. But if it if we were doing it, it would be like these little dots of these little droplets. It's I it's just that that's a sort of detail that's just delightful when you're watching this movie. And I'm saying I'm approximating them just a little bit because recently I actually did get into soldering and like taught myself how to do it, how to repair like some old electronics, and it's a really fun experience and. The ethos behind it is, well, it is this whole thing that the borrowers do. It is DIY. It is reusing. It is creating new things out of, yeah, re- well, old things. Repurposing, yeah. Repurposing. Recycling, yeah. And, it, and it's so evident in the entire house. So for one, I think we mentioned, we talked about this briefly before the cast. I don't know why we throw out our golden nuggets before the cast like this we do it always by the way and then we repeat it at each other like you know like pretending we're having the conversation for the first time but we talked a little bit you and me played and we talked about how you know in one way all this repurposing of you know using like a you know household items like a flower pot as a furnace and all of that stuff is for one thing you have to have that in a movie about little people it is Appeal, yes, right? it's right. the whole point. Like, it is fascinating to see, okay, what fantasy. what do they use to live? Like the little pin needle turns into a sword, into a sword, sword. That's such a hard word to say. Sword. It's just a sword. You a just sword. don't pronounce the W. It's yeah, a, the there's w a W, is w which, which is silent, which is And, and both of the U's are silent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> English, fix it, please. Holy fuck. Yeah. Um, but, you know, <laughs> nails in the walls turn into like little... Ladder step rungs yeah. and step yeah. rungs, yeah. right, as they climb through the walls. And, like, if you really the sit staples. down and study carefully, like, what is the interior decoration? All of it is made of some piece of junk left behind by humans and repurposed. And this is such a uh, um, good illustration of the idea that instead of just throwing away what we have and buying new, there is a way that is to really make use of every piece of, you know, junk you have. To... Yeah, and you know, Nyard, yeah. that's that 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 you know, philosophy of or this 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 sort of lifestyle of waste and decadence um that the humans have that we have in our consumer society, it's it's even present in our language in the fact that we call all of these little knickknacks junk, right? Right. It's we 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 call them garbage even though they are perfectly useful, even if not for their original purpose, right? It's this idea that, oh, once a thing has, uh, you know, outlived its original purpose, it no longer can have purpose. It no longer is useful. It's just junk. Right. Yeah. And and this is exactly what the borrowers really change. And this is, by the way, also why they're called borrowers, right? Like, when they take... They never take anything that the humans would miss. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the 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 big moment that reveals exactly what they're up to is when Arietti picks up the little nail, uh, the, the little pin sword yes. thing, which, which is like way over, like, like almost falling through the cracks of the floorboard in the corner uh, beneath the table, and it's, and and it's very clear that like uh, the, the the father is like. You know what? That is clearly something that they have forgotten and dropped, and you know won't find and won't need. Like you just did your first boring. Congratulations, right. my girl. Yeah. Or like yeah. stuff like sugar, right? They're taking just one cube of sugar, and it will last them for a very long time. Nobody yeah. is gonna miss that one cube of sugar. And you know, as I said before, yeah. the, before the cast, we talked about for one, this is appeal. Like we want to see how they engineer this. How do they survive? What do they do? But also, it is really potent symbolism because what we have is a huge, rich household. We understand she's driving a Mercedes, like a very expensive foreign car, very well known as a like, luxury item. But the entire house is fashioned in very Victorian, very rich, very excessive stylings. And they have so much 
that they pretty much don't notice the one cube of sugar that is missing. The allegory here for me is again class-based. It is there are poor people who are just trying to live in this society and for them the way they live is they subsist off of that what is left or not missed by the people, the elites, the rich people, the ones so dominant in this society, so excessive that they have everything in such quantity that they are not in want or need of anything. Whereas the borrowers scrape by on the remains, you know? I think they're not so much borrowers, they're gleaners. That's a... All right, in case you don't know, in case you haven't seen the uh, uh, the, the Agnes Varda uh, documentary film uh, about it, like... Uh, gleaning is is, is like uh, originally it, it referred to some like uh, part part of farm work where after the harvest of, uh, of 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 wheat there was some leftovers around and women would like go through the, these fields and like just pick up whatever useful leftovers were left and like just everyone was like allowed to do that you know it's it's not like this is my field so you can't do that. And then later on, it would become like a like uh, a legal part of it. At least, like in, in France, it is a legal right that the king granted that you are allowed to pick up the remains of other people's stuff if you find it useful. Um, that, is, that is really fascinating. Yeah. I, I read, is is the word yeah. I think. Yeah, I read them and, in a uh, little bit of a different way because. Uh, uh, oh, please go on. Yeah. Oh, who's gone? Uh, you played because you you you. I th- I, I, th- I found it like you had still something to say about the gleaning. Yeah, yeah but um, yeah, but I, I know about this concept from uh, from uh, Agnes Valda, um, who is a, a, a French director. Uh, she, she, she was like part of the start of the French New Wave, uh, and and in her later years, she, she made like different like interesting documentaries. But like, and she was sort of like uh, in her documentary, uh, the gleaners and I, she like compared that process of like picking up like whatever is around and 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 using it to her process of filmmaking as a documentary filmmaker that that you you just take take the camera and like pick up what's there um and and you are allowed to do that uh which is like a fascinating concept like uh, and i think you sort of like Got close to that yard earlier when you talked about how Miyazaki just like takes ideas, you know, mm-hmm. from 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 his uh, from his surroundings, from half remembered uh, children's stories that right. he's always wanted to do something with. Creation you know, it's, is it's borrowing, just, right? Yeah, it's, it's we are this type of uh, yeah gleaning. Yeah, we are immersed in a world of culture and items and stuff surrounded by yes. it, right? And it is available for the creative mind to repurpose and. The borrowers are characterized by this, right? Like their entire lives is eking out like a small existence, not seen by the big ones, by the elites. Oh my God, I just came. There is a small comparison here, which isn't perfect, but I get, now I find, okay, it's interesting. Parasite. Oh yeah. (laughs) Like living hidden in the big rich people house. There's less antagonism here obviously because like they're not li- living out the excess upstairs like where the rich people usually live but instead they're like yeah. modest and happy about subsisting in this way so the comparison between parasite and this movie of course illustrative in this sense because really what the borrowers illustrate is a sort certain lifestyle of being happy in a way to live in a way repurposing other things refashioning things uh I think modesty is a good term here. I think Miyazaki would approve of the term modest. I think he would like it. What I think of in a I, comparison, I think Yonabayashi would Yonabayashi would also approve of it because modest heroes is like that 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 that's him, right? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's yeah. right. And the the thing that I needed to think uh, think of in terms of real life comparison was not gleaming but squatting. So this may be a bit more controversial, but. At least I, I, in I, 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 I always remember to squat whenever I uh, uh, go to the gym. So yeah, I'll, I'll explain. No, it skip a leg bit. day. <laughs> so especially oh, that's not what you meant. Hmm. <laughs> especially in Germany, I I know it's international as well, but especially in Germany, there has been a long history of so-called squatting culture, which is that let's say in a big city like Berlin, an empty building which isn't 
housing which isn't used commercially, which is just unused, standing empty, and homeless people or like left wingers or whoever else, like groups, will find this empty house and just live in it, you know, in the sense that they will make this home their home. Because oftentimes, especially due to, and I don't want to get too much into the details, but of how like trading of housing happens, it can be that there are financial and investment and tax advantages to simply own a home to refuse to use it for anything productive. Yeah, keep, keeping, it, keeping it as an asset and selling it on to other people who keep it as an asset to sell it on to other people. And this, like, so you have these big luxury empty apartments or in, entire buildings, which just switch owners between various uh, money institutions like three times a day, but no one ever lives in them. But even it's a, worse, it's, like it's, it's a big, the... it's a big problem, like on a global yeah, scale. Exactly, but it's not just luxury apartments but it's oftentimes the houses fall into disrepair so this mm. is where the beautiful thing about squatting comes in right so there there has been a history especially long in berlin especially recently in the news again because one of the famous like squats was recently you know invaded by police um but there has been a history of like alternative communities forming in you know occupied houses they will take these houses they will renovate them and they will basically eke out an existence repairing and refashioning this home to be you know their home and their real goal ultimately is to not be seen by the state which wants them gone by the owner which wants them gone but to instead just you know live there and what i notice about the similarity between the borrowers and squatting is that they have the same tendency to practice intense diy of scraping together items to refashion, to reuse, to repair the house they live in and to make it beautiful and colorful, not in excessive ways where they like buy like tons of paint or like uh, uh, decorators or like an interior design architect or anything, but by just doing it themselves, by finding things they like and like by fashioning them, them into something that looks pretty. And it's often this really patchwork aesthetic of building a home out of the things you can get your hand on, that you can repurpose, that you can make, have to form a life. And actually, it is not a strictly illegal practice necessarily, because oftentimes, especially in Germany, there have been agreements between the local governments accepting that these empty buildings sort of are handed over to a community living there, as long as they maintain the building and as long as they are actually doing a community service which is why i love it so much so mm. i have been friends actually with like some berlin uh, uh, uh alternative left-wing people who were living in a in a squad and working closely actually of all things with a local church to get homeless kids who are drug addicted off the streets and to help them sober up by living in that house wow and that's like the most powerful thing like the borrowers don't really embody this community aid aspect in the movie but i'm necessarily mm, brought from spiller's side yeah well Sp Perhaps. spiller definitely like i mean there's definitely a way that that he's like helping out and definitely there's a support structure there but yeah. here in the movie they are dying out well the sad history of squatting in in in, in my view said is also that this kind of culture is also dying out restrictions have been elaborated these houses end up at some point being cleared up by police by states by owners who want them out who want to just demolish the building or whatever and the thing is also this kind of culture this alternative community building that had to be hidden at the edges of society to be able to live to be able to survive is fading i think what we see in the borrowers is a depiction in a way of course, I don't think Norton was influenced by squatting culture to write her 50s novel about, you know, uh, little people living in the house. She was inspired by the post-war era, era where solidarity between diminished people, as it was said, uh, formed and where communities formed on that basis. But I think it translates perfectly into this modern era where we can be reminded by the borrowers of how little damage squatting does and how much good it does for the people who live there. The squat that was recently uh, much news trouble in German media was a explicitly queer community 
which often provided a home for queer kids or queer young adults who lost their homes because they were excised by their parents. And this kind of community that really provides a community service that really helps people not be homeless, helps people find a place, has for a very long time now been antagonized by the media and kind of, you know, broken apart by police, by media, by public opinion even. And that's, I think, also the same risk, and this is how I'm tying it in, the same risk the borrowers really face, right? They exist in a society that as soon as they are spotted, and we see that in the housekeeper Haru, she will call them thieves. She will say, well, in a sense, she doesn't say it explicitly, she, she says thieves. She wants the thieves gun, the plagues, the pests. She wants to call an exterminator right. to get rid of them. These are parasites to her. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, that's uh, and and it's and it's so like, man. Just H Haru is just like the the fucking worst. <laughs> I just I've she's just so like so, such a petty asshole. Uh, who who's like whose petty asshole actions like genuinely like put the these characters' lives at risk and and their happiness at risk. And it's just. That, that that just feels so like somewhat worse than like these like bigger like badder villains mm. that like do a lot of uh, of bad shit like she's so just I think like under... so much more dislikable like it's yeah she's same... very dislikable yeah. and I think that that's yeah. uh... it's it's the Umbridge Voldemort uh, comparison <laughs> you know? the bad thing wow. is it, however to, that Harrow is Harry so Potter real fandom. right because you know yes. what the first reaction to squatting mm. is it is oh they're stealing a landlord's house. What are they? Are they entitled to this? Why huh. can't they just have this? Shouldn't they be like, I don't know, like owning this, putting in the work for this? They're parasites. Mm. They're sucking, you know, the lifeblood of working people. And, you know, it is couldn't really be further from the truth because, I mean, in terms of squats, I think I don't want to provoke political debate yet now necessarily in the comments. There could be divergent opinions on this. But in the case of Boros, we understand they don't do harm. Like the text explicitly highlights how they're harmless, how they're taking things nobody wants anymore, nobody uses, and surviving by them. And yet <laughs> the very the fact yeah, that they bad. take is seen mm -hmm. by Haru, who so embodies this mindset, as theft. And this yeah. is the interesting thing. It is real. It that, I don't think she makes for like a narratively super compelling villain because she is just evil and resentful towards the borrowers. But okay. when she I, says I gotta... it is theft, I think it clicks in place that this is about the ideological difference here. Yeah, okay. I, I, I like this reading a lot, but I think that we're a little bit um, demonizing Haru to a point that is getting outside of what I think that she's meant to function as, um, which is not as just, you know, this sort of greedy landlord or landowning, you know, elite. After all, she's just the housekeeper. She's well, I didn't not mean the to equate her house. with the landlord. Well, I meant more to equate her with, like, the public society's perception of resentment against people who they think are entitled in what they do to survive. But you see, that's, that's just the thing, is that... In, I, I, I do like this reading. I want to say I do like this reading, but I want to provide an alternative reading. Um, that there is a distinction because the to begin with, Haru doesn't see the borrowers as people. She sees them as like, you know, pests, animals, um, you know, insects or rodents that are need to be eradicated because they're encroaching on human, um, you know, the, the space of human occupation on the belongings yeah. and the, you know, the, and resources that humans have hoarded. Same with squatting, by the way. <laughs> just, just, sure, just sure. But, 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 well, okay, sure. In, there there are German, some people who have actually, dehumanize the yeah. squatters, but... Well, Anti-lefty anti slurs in Germany are generally referring to them as parasitic insects, as ticks, you know? That, yeah. That's like the thing. Okay, well, that's fair enough. But... What I want to get to is perhaps the more uh, uh, where where does this metaphor come from, right? It comes from this perspective of human civilization to view things in the natural world as things to be pushed away, things to be diminished so that humans can take up more space, right? 
there's the there's the conversation that happens between Sho and Arietti, where Sho, in his naivete, says that, um, you know, that it is the borrower's fate to die out, that they will go extinct. Um, and this is this perspective of, oh, you know, it's the fate for humans to take up more and more of the world and for nature to recede is a very, uh, that that has been, you know, culturally ingrained into show because it tells this perspective from, you know, uh, human society as the, you know, as the supreme form of, uh, you know, the cultivation of earth, right? And Ariat- Arietti, you know, uh, rebuts that. She says, fate? Are you kidding me? It's it's you humans who have been pushing us away and who have been diminishing the natural spaces, right? And Haru is just emblematic of that lack of, um, that lack of, of, of critical awareness of how humans have exploited nature and the possessiveness that humans have over, uh, over natural resources. Mm. Um, I I think, I think you're on the right uh, track there. I I just think the character of Haru just like takes it from, you know, um, callousness and carelessness to like active malice. Like like she seems to take like glee in capturing these uh, these creatures and in, ensuring right, their demise. Her, she is a fat which, which, Yeah. I, 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 no, 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 no. I just think that that's a bit she's, like... She's, that makes her a bit we, much. We're thinking like, of that that way because we see the humanized borrowers. We see them as people. But to Haru, she just sees them as, as you know, creatures that are pests, right? So she's not so malicious. Be, it's just that there is a maliciousness. The point is that there is an inherent maliciousness in the way humans treat other animals and pests and as, as pests, right? And that is what she embodies to me. It's, it's, it's taking this assumption that, oh, it's okay to treat animals this way because, oh, they, they get into our cupboards and in our pantries and they eat our food, so we're just going to call the exterminators... And it's criticizing that um, by comparing it to a person, you know, uh, you know, dehumanizing, uh, you know, people like squatters and and that kind of thing, right? But I think it, it's it's trying to create this comparison to um, this attitude, this philosophy that humans have towards the way they treat nature as the cause of what has caused their alienation from nature, right? Which is the cause of Sho's sickness, you know, that he feels in this modern society of excess, there is no connectedness between people, between nature. And yet the borrowers, not only do they repurpose things and they are very in community with uh, nature, like for ex- like, even to the point where they don't they don't kill the the bugs, even though the bugs are like giant to them. They it's just part of their everyday life. They coexist, right? It's not something they try to get rid of, um, so that they can take up more space. Yeah, um, like the the, and, the um the beginning of the movie, the the, uh, the the I think the grasshoppers or cicadas or something. Uh-huh. Just 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 they're treated the uh, the borrowers treat them like like pets. Yeah, and, and then like little and then later animals in the movie, that are there. And later in the movie, you have Arietti just sit, sitting around, and this this little beetle comes up, and she like plays a bit with it and lets it go, and you see it like go over to its uh, its pal, and just like uh, th- they touch their feelers against each other, and and, and yeah. keep going. So yeah. cute. And in in this use in in this lifestyle of repurposing things, right? Resources. Because the resources are so scarce, instead of relying on material things for security, they rely on each other, right? It builds community because they are treating the material world and the natural resources there with respect, right? That they they don't use materialism as a replacement for, uh, you know, 
their security in their community. It it has this sort of symbiotic relationship where where you know their communal living allows them to work together and repurpose things and 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 survive and then you know mm-hmm. the scarcity of resources you know uh makes it so that they have to work together even more yeah. um and I, I, yes. I, I think what i think what really like bugs me about haru like specifically is like the, the, of course there's this like uh like as, as a thematic foil to show it's, it's like yeah it's, it's pretty obvious in that way um but like the, the thing is like like show's grandma seems like just excited about the idea that these things are there right on i have and so, and, and yeah. so watching the movie like even if all these things are there like just th- there's just this feeling that if haru wasn't there like everything would would have just been like cool they, so they, they, is- they, they'd be like the show would have seen them and, and it would be like it would be fine because like come on like like they they, they wouldn't do anything about them I'm it's just of- because haru is there like in the text if Haru wasn't there, like everything would have been fine, and that's part of the reason why Haru so. feels so, so if, if cartoonish. We, if we think, a, a, first of all, I disagree. But second of all, if we take a part of the out of the text, the message is altered. Isn't really a huge revelation. Here's here's my thesis: <laughs> tying 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 all of the <laughs> so, humans together. Right. Um, I think I agree with everything Voice said, and I also think this, the squatting reading is neither incompatible because it's not never a direct allegory. It's always like vague right. ideas, right? We're talking about big people and little people. We're talking about elites and poor people. We're talking about big society and squatters. We're talking about humans being lesser beings like animals. We're also talking about colonialism. And yeah. in that sense, we're getting really, really real because the complications of colonialism are once the state of colonialism is established, there is a problem that even, let's say, a white savior narrative is also a problem. Remember when Sho rips off the roof of the house yeah. to put in a kitchen to help? He's a monster in that moment. He looks like a monster. He's disrupting everything. He's ruining things for them by giving the hints to reveal their location. You know, it's, it's all in a way symbolic for how there is no really healthy interaction between those communities. And when the grandmother talks about them, she's kind of like just mythologizing the idea of little people. She's dreaming of them. She has she keeps that little dollhouse around. Like for her, it's like a like a fantasy primitivist thing. yeah maybe like a noble savage maybe like all like like just yeah, orientalism yeah. like it's a it's an admirable cute little thing like it's not really something to worry about like she doesn't really think it's a real thing in a way i see in those people different reactions of colonialist you know uh, empire and this yeah, gets even more yeah. this gets even more interesting when we think about the fact that this novel was written in britain in what has been described by critics as the post-war and post-Victorian area, also negotiating the fall of the British Empire and the ramifications that this left behind. Especially the 50s and onwards were marked by a huge phase of uh, a post-colonial effects on Britain. In university, I studied, uh, uh, had a few classes on literature, especially by British black immigrants that came sometime during the 40s, 50s to Britain to help rebuild after the war. And these their experiences and how over generations assimilation and fitting in and coexistence with British society was really hard and almost impossible. I think it's marvelous that here again we carry the signifiers of this British Empire, the Victorian stylings of the rooms, into the human spaces. And the dollhouse. And the dollhouse, which we are to understand explicitly as an expression of those the big and the powerful, the excessive lifestyles, yeah, the material the, excess, yeah, yeah, the grandiosity of what what their empire basically styles itself. The aesthetic of empire is present in this film, and in the human characters, even if benevolent like Sho, and even if also kind of benevolent like the grandma, it is expressed the different problems that the colonial legacy brings with it. Sho ultimately cannot become the white savior. I mean, he's Japanese, but you know what I mean. And I think that is part the, of the why proverbial, the, the proverbial, proverbial white, white savior. savior, indeed, the colonial savior, yeah. or that exactly. And I don't think like the like 
we're, we're having all these really big brain readings. And I want to just be clear to the audience listening to this, that I don't think any of these map one-to-one -one or like in a very definitive way where you can say, oh, this is about colonialism because the grandmother represents uh, Queen Victoria. No, that's... <laughs> <laughs> We don't have Wait. that. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that, but we have so many hints strewn all about this film that evoke these ideas, that evoke yeah. and borrow from the original text, which had also experienced an identity crisis in Britain after Britain's identity was disrupted, not just by the fall of their own empire, only merely like 30 to 40, 50 years before, and also the, the, the Second World War. So these things do carry over. As Miyazaki and Suzuki said in the very beginning, as we talked about the script, it is all in the book. <laughs> yeah. And I want to go back to the scene where, where he replaces the kitchen because specifically because that kitchen from the dollhouse is modeled after a, a Victorian style home, like shows a assumption that that kitchen would be preferable to the one yes. that they created for themselves is this arrogance in that cultural identity and you know that the this kind of material excess would be you know implicitly preferable mm. to the the borrowers right yeah i was, I was actually like it, it, it felt like i was still like kind of searching for like what exactly the, the the character arc of Arietti was, aside from like making a mistake and learning from it, uh, like at the start of the movie when she goes out and they explore the area and they enter the dollhouse, yeah. she is just awestruck by it, yes. and 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 her father says, "This this is for their dolls. This is not for us. We can't take anything here because they'll see it's missing." Yeah. Um, and well, like, really, what he's saying is, "This is." material excess and we don't need all this like, yes yeah, yeah. That, that's, he even that's says part of it, to yeah. his wife not to bring the anything from the from the dollhouse even mm. though they're leaving yeah exactly and I, I think that's like by the end of the movie i think arietti agrees with that I, I, yeah. I think by the end of the movie she's like no i i, I don't want like your your dollhouse because that's not that, that's not ours that's not mine and, and I, th I think part of like, I, th I think part of me like just part of me just wishes that that could work, you know. Part of I me think, just, just yeah. wishes that 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 the, um, the 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 absent mother who it, it turns out is like like she was the one who like really got obsessed with these uh, these little uh, little people uh, being there. Like if she had just like met them and become friends with them and given them that dollhouse, wouldn't that have been nice? I just no because the, no, the, exactly. the lesson that, that you show learns outcomes. the lesson that show learns is how to how to strive how to survive the meaning that is there when we live in community and and repurpose things and don't take for granted all this material excess right his mother couldn't be that because she didn't learn the lesson she goes on to be a you know uh you know a businesswoman who neglects her own son when she when he's about to have a you know a potentially uh fatal surgery you know like for show it's it's learning the ethos of the borrower's lifestyle that that changes him yeah, and that sure, is able to, sure. to heal his heart isn't it great? Like he comes into this house, this house where his mother once lived, which is now, well, absent of his mother. He's alone most of the time reading books to himself because that is the only thing he can do and has a sickness of the heart. But by the end, he learns that magic in a way does exist and the magic is the lifestyle and mindset of the borrowers and that is what heals him. Like there is, yes. this is why it is speaking to the current generation as Miyazaki claims, because it is taking something familiar, our society, it defamiliarizes it, exhibits and showcases the alienation within it through the character of Sho and through how empty this house is and then introduces an alternative lifestyle. Uh, especially Miyazaki as a writer loves the idea of something that you kind of remember, but that is long forgotten, like something out of your past yeah. that comes back mm. to you, like going into oh, yeah, the woods that, at the comfort That's tree. really Miyazaki call. Yeah. Yeah. But and, importantly, it's yeah. not primitivism, right? Yeah, it's not primitivism, it's solidarity. 
It's solidarity because, but it's still learning about, it's taking from nature the lessons of resourcefulness and, you know, and and community and connection. Sustainability right? is also a term that is really significant here. But mm. you know what's interesting? You know how there's always this, uh, you know, in, in mythology, the, the character who goes to the underworld has to come back with some artifact that is proof of their journey there and the changes that they underwent, you know, in... in, in in a uh, spirited way, you know, Chihiro gets uh, the, 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 the little hair hair, yeah. hair band with the beads that was handmade by you know uh, Zaniba and and No Face and the and the you know the baby turned into a mouse and the little fly. In this film, Sho gets something to prove his connection to remember his connection with Arietti as well, but it's not some magical thing. It's actually a mundane, human-made artifact. It's a little clip meant for, like, closing a bag of chips or crisps. But it was used for her. It was used as her hair clip. It was repurposed as something, right? And in a way, Sho is... he He's... He... That, that sort of resourcefulness, that repurposing of things can also even be applied to his own life. He's going to repurpose his life, you know, into a, you know, lifestyle of that, that is, that is healthier, that is less alienated. Mm. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I, if I agree with that. I'm not sure at any point that like show really learns that like, recycling and a lack of excess is like the true way to be i don't think that like really well, is present in his character arc although like <laughs> symbolically i suppose it, it it works but i, I don't know I, I i just don't what he learns really find is that that's a compelling read no what he learns is the possibility to, to survive the, the possibility to survive which is coupled with resourcefulness and recycling and sustainability in the way that the borrowers live that out, right? Mm. So those those things are linked. Maybe he doesn't necessarily explicitly think about that aspect, right? But it is linked. And, you know, uh, I think that the, the symbolism involved in what Arietti giving show being actually not from, not some borrower made thing, you know, but actually something that is from human society shows, you know, hey, you've, you've gained from, from me, we've gained from you, right? There's this exchange. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'm losing thread a little bit here, but I, I think it's important. I, 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 to me, symbolically, like the fact that it's not some you know, m- like some magical artifact that that he's given, but rather something very mundane. Yeah, um, I, 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 I it's think transformed that, that, symbolically into this spiritual change. Here's one yeah, more the, layer the, to the, it the too. The gesture is really. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Neon. Yeah, the one more layer is that the hair clip Arietti uses to transform herself. She puts it on when she goes mm. uh, boring, when she That's goes true. climbing, when she goes be brave. That is what she does when she puts it on. When she sneaks out of the house at night to go meet uh, with Sho, for, uh, not at night, but when her mom is sleeping and her dad is working, um, she puts in the clip to be brave, to climb, to try to fix the situation. It marks in her the change from, you know, Arietti, the girl at home with like the open hair loosely, you know, on her shoulders to serious mode. And this marker of her possibility to transform into someone who like, you know, faces risk, adversity, danger, scary things with this bravery is good for him, who is scared to fucking death of his surgery. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I I just, I, I still feel like Sho's um, arc in, in connection with uh, with Arietes and, and the Boros is, is one of the more undercooked parts of the movie, uh, to be honest. Mm. Like, it, it feels, it honestly feels perfunctory, this whole, like, uh, oh, having met you, I now have found the will to live and hooray. Um, which it's, it's like, I, I like show as a character, especially like the dynamic of like him having such a weak heart and being necessarily like, like uh, slow moving and calm um, 
in in contrast with the energetic uh, uh, Arietti, and also in contrast with how like massive and monstrous he feels uh, from like the the little people's perspective. I really like that uh, that element of it. I, I I just feel like the the whole like oh in conclusion I now found the courage to live because. Uh, so I, I have to have a character arc too. No, no, no. That's how it felt to me. It is, it, is, felt it, is, to me. it is purely symbolic. I, I, I I'm yeah, not yeah. the one who like really wants the needs to like follow it. Follow the like character arc structure cookbook where we have like a in te, a, a, in plot and in symbol explanation both. I mm. I'm fine with like it being. And a symbolic expression of some societal thing, right? And I, I, I think maybe, maybe shows, part of it is um, shows sickness maybe, of the heart to me is a sense of alienation. And I think shows yes, most yeah. important function is to look wistfully and sad after Ariadne's departure. Yeah, yeah that yeah. is his most important that's a, role. That's his function. Because, yeah. because I think that is the one thing that if that was missing, this would be a film about irreconcilable cultural difference and the impossibility of you know growing together. But this is yeah, not yeah, this yeah. film. The film points yeah. out a power imbalance. The film points out a risk to diminished or, or lower status communities. And show is the kind-hearted people who do want this connection and who are bemoaning and are sad about the impossibility of achieving a utopian state in which everyone can be community. I, I think I think my, my main issue is is like because I, I absolutely agree with you there that that, that like the, the the point of show show's character is like that relationship which which is like interesting and, and always really charming when they have their little dialogue scenes that like hesitancy between them and and the bond they form that that's really sweet i i, I think what uh what, what kind of bugs me is that like he he, he doesn't have like it doesn't feel like as much as a as a character flaw that's overcome. It feels like his disease is cured, which is like it just feels cheap to me. You know, like well, <laughs> he, he has an actual physical disease of his heart. His disease that, is not cured. I, I mean, he's still going to go into the surgery, but his like his heart yeah, is but healed it's sort in the of sense implied. that the, the, his you know, it's sort of implied that, that symbolic... now now he has the courage to like. To, to live and, Get and the if surgery, he didn't, yeah. maybe, maybe he would have died during surgery. Which let's, is just, let's go back. Which is a, it, it, no, I, I don't like that. I, uh, first of let's all, I don't back. like I don't like the approach of saying like that he needs to overcome a flaw within the narrative. Like I, the, the, this sounds like one of these writing one on one. No, no, he doesn't. That I don't... He absolutely doesn't. Which which is why like his whole which is why I mentioned that his whole speech about oh having met you and I have have the courage to live feels perfunctory feels cheap because no, like it no, feels no, like no, oh on. he should have this development and no, wait, here no. it is and 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 i just don't buy that's it not a thing all. where you overcome a flaw alienation is not a flaw it is the state of society and he it represents that yeah like I, the I, young I, people I just, growing I just, up I just, are don't, disheartened. I just don't like how his heart disease is directly tied to his alienation i guess i think that's symbolically not, very powerful no 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 okay so so it's it's the fact that he doesn't have the will to get better Right. It's not that his heart disease is magically cured. Right. Though, you know, it's it's rather that he now has under the state, his previous state of alienation, he didn't have the will to go on living. Right. All beyond species his will heart die surgery. out, but I will probably die before you. He said exactly. And so at the end, now he wants to live. He says, "I I will live." Right. But we shouldn't take this as a, you know, a prophetic statement of fact. No, we, we, we kind of already know be. he's going to live because the narrative and voice is fine, from the future. But the, you know, for, but from his, several but summers his, later. And that's fine. That's fine. Rather, his determination is not the moment of healing. It's it's a moment of a change in perspective. It's he becomes less alienated because he met. Arietti, and because he helped Arietti in some small way, even though his presence and the presence of humans that he is a part of as a whole uh, do threaten, you know, the, uh, the 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 borrower's way of life, there was still some collaboration. There was still some extending of 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 the arm to to help one another, and and that community. Um, is what gives him the will to live. We come back to Miyazaki's favorite thing, right? Ikiru. 
how how mm. how to live and live you know like you have to live the you cannot be stuck in a place where you want to die or hide yourself from the world or isolate yourself from the world but how do you live right this question and in in a way when sho does the comparison says well all these animals died out you will die out but i will die before you what he is saying is it is inevitable you give up hope you don't try to survive and thrive we will die we will all die you know it's it's really angsty in a way but it's like he's faced with his mortality because ahead of him is a surgery that might end up fatal and i think it's so illustrative of the this young life could end now and he's disheartened <laughs> disheartened by by this um how does he gain motivation to f- face living and this is what ariety demonstrate by surviving and thriving in front of his eyes surviving dangerous situations with incredible courage like uh and, and making so hard little. decisions to give up the home too yeah that's right oh i do i do love the how you know ariety's mom uh homily sort of oh, you know at first, she's, like, very uh, resistant to leave. She's like, oh, this home is so nice. Like, you know, this it's I, I don't want to leave this. We'll never have a, a home as beautiful as this again. But after it starts getting destroyed, you know, first by Sho and then by Haru, you know, pulling up everything um, uh, and, and, like, picking her out of the, the kitchen and then, and then Sho, like, dishevels it. You know, once the house is already destroyed... What is there to do except for go on living, go find a new place and make a new home? You know, and at the end of the movie, she's also like, she she doesn't she doesn't um, bemoan the loss of the home as much as maybe she uh, thought she would. It's it's one thing to leave behind a home that is perfect, and another thing to be uh, forced out of one's home because calamity already destroyed the home and now you have to, there's <laughs> yeah. no choice but to just keep yeah. on living, you know? Yeah, I mean, what is a home other than the people that live in it, you know? And they, they when they pack up, they put in their bags and this is home now. Like, the mother takes the, the, the painting she likes, but, or rather, I think it's like a postcard or like from a magazine. It's just a yeah. picture of the ocean. Yeah. That is what's important <laughs> to her. That's the least yeah, like, materially useful thing. But she took it with her because, right. you know, it's meaningful to her. That is what makes it home. She wants to see the ocean. She's, that's her dream. She takes that, you know. And I, uh, this is kind of also how the film negotiates, like, the theme of the meaning of a home. What is a real home? Like, we are experiencing the homey place in the very beginning. We immediately understand, yeah, this is cozy. This is home. They made this themselves. Oh she builds a garden in her room by just picking up random, you know, plants and putting them all over the place. And she makes it home. But then the movie goes on to explore more ideas of home. We see the alienating yes. home. We see show alone and just reading books in this big house, way too big for the and three people that live in that, it. When he was living at his previous home with his absent mother and his divorced father living with probably another family or something, it's like he's coming from an even, you know, more alienated, you know, uh, living situation, which isn't can't even be called a home. Right. And but there's still these assumptions of, oh, what makes a home is the material things, right? That's why the, you know, the grandfather made the dollhouse for the, for the uh, borrowers and why Sho tries to give them the, the new, oh, do you like your new kitchen? Like, what the hell, dude? You destroyed our house. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it's not about <laughs> the material things that make the home, um, which is the assumption that he has coming from, um, uh, you know, the society he grew up in. Right, yeah. and he kind of learns a new definition of home, and that is this this support structure, this this community that works together to to get by and to survive. And and it's another thing you just mentioned now that gets back to the whole like the way the story is told through uh, through the backgrounds uh, very much. It, it's like the contrast between uh, the, the home of the borrowers and the the home of the human family is like the 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 borrowers' home is just. Um, it's kind of cluttered, but yeah. not in a me- in, but but not but not in a messy way. Like it, it's it's not like they need to clean up. It's just yeah. Like th- there's there's a lot of little bits and pieces that come together, and every there's item is a not story. A, yeah, and and, and there's yeah. not a lot of space between like, like the, the table and the wall, but but like it's fine. 
uh, like it's 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 cozy, it's it's homey, it's it's filled with like life. All the and, items and, and have like, meaning, and so many people live yeah, in such yeah. close, tight, small spaces. Like the three of them are really yeah, exactly, on top of exactly, each other yeah. in a way. Whereas the yeah, big house, can... multiple stories, like empty rooms. The the old lady is away most of the day with just the housekeeper and 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 the boy being around the yeah, house. Yeah, and 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 you often have these shots of of, of like like you have wide shots with like floor to floor to ceiling like. The the big distances uh, b b between different rooms. Yeah, the empty um, and wasted yeah. space, and it's and, depersonalized. And another, that is the most important yeah, thing about the detail house's I interior. Noticed, and another detail I'm, I'm noticing because I I, I like to like ha have the the film running on mute while while we record this. Yeah. I think I noticed there's like a lot, like there's so many labels in mm. the humans' home. Like we, whenever we move past like. Um, so, so like like a a cupboard with stuff in it, or in in the in the the kitchen with all, all the machines and the, and the various things, uh, and and there's like detail shots of like them going through the washing room, and you can see that there's there are all these labels on these clearly defined. Here's the laundry detergent. Here's the um, here's the canned you, you know tuna or something like that, and 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 it's like it's. Well, that's what you're talking about. That it's de depersonalized. It's all products. It's it's not like it's not gathered. It's not like labored over. It's not uh, you know handmade. It's it also feels uh, very stratified and top down. Like it's top down yeah, culture. Yeah. It's like the big advertised uh, brands. Yeah. Like Mercedes and, and, and another, has like, like dropped in the yeah. film, right? All that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 Blinken, you'll miss it. But when um, when Sho and um, and Ar Arietti are like escaping his locked room through the room next door that room is really cluttered and if you take a look there's a television set there there's no old, old you know television there there's there's lots of like junk yeah. in there you know like 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 junk in the proverbial sense of like they don't it's need it and there's, there's even yeah. a, i think there's even a bust you know you know a uh a, a st statue like but you know yeah. a, bust uh -huh, a bust there yeah. which like and and it's all like you know, s stuff that they have no use for, but have anyway. Uh, and are and keeping I, yeah. in a room where it's not a, ever appreciated, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, if you know, art doesn't have a material purpose to it, but um, it's meant to be appreciated and, and to sort of, you know... Uh, have people interact with it, right? But if it's put into this, you know, spare room, hidden away, you know, uh, under, you know, sheets or just in behind a locked door, you know, it's just like, it's completely wasteful. Ice. Let's get back into it. So I think with the, uh, you know, our coverage of the themes and somewhat of the plot and, and things like that, we kind of talked about most of the characters, but we have Spiller, the other borrower, the the wild boy. Oh yeah, we really and haven't mentioned him at all. We haven't really mentioned him yet. And then there's the cat, of course. So, oh yeah, very central character. Like has <laughs> has the most impactful character arc of the whole movie. Yeah, I think Spiller embodies the idea that borrowers are in in some ways always survivalists, right? That yeah, there's different means of surviving. There's like you know, let's take. Pompoko again, like there's tanuki scrounging things together in the city, living off the junk that people leave uh, around the streets and living from that. But there's tanuki who still live in the wild and, you know, do their business there. That's kind of different ways of surviving in a world where civilization, industrialization, urbanization is encroaching on the spaces where you live. Right. In a way, Spiller is the he he is a primitivist right he rejects all of these uh you know artifacts of like of yeah. human civilization which the borrowers like the the you know uh Arietti's family kind of makes use of like they don't reject human engineering or you know invention they repurpose it but spiller rejects it Right, he would yeah. rather not deal with it. He's so mistrustful of it that he reject, doesn't reject want. Uh, reject modernity. Return to flying squirrel. <laughs> oh my god, his flying squirrel <laughs> glider is so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that, that's again, that's the fantasy. Like, if you're li yeah. a little little people, like, uh, how does this guy get around? I have an idea. <laughs> you know, it's just it's yeah. just neat. It's real neato. 
This is such a that's such an inspired film in so many ways, with so much creativity pouring into every aspect of you know how they live, what they do, the small people, and so on. It, it's yeah. it's always a marvel. Like you know, we do the big thematic analysis always, but sometimes you just gotta pause a frame, look in the background, see that they used like a like a you know stamp from like a letter as a as a as a <laughs> poster on the wall. And it's yeah. like yeah, yeah, it's like a how, how they use um, a little frames they poster. They use insect wings instead of feathers for quills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And how oh, and Arietti just like picking up the roly poly and like like bouncing it up and down in, in her, her hands like a toy ball or something like that. That was that was cute. Oh roly poly, is that how they're called? These 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 Well, you know? that's that's one of them. A pill bug is the other name for it. But yeah, oh, I roly knew poly how is like called. a children's name for a pill bug. That's cute. It's technically a crustacean. Um but yeah. Mm. Yeah, they're fucking weird. I Wait, like so that so they, they have, like they googly, have more... googly eyes, like the insect, like the 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 yeah. grasshoppers have like big googly eyes. Yeah, no, they don't. They they're well, they they have very small eyes that are like really embedded underneath their their exoskeleton, their shell, which rolls up, right? Um, yeah. Um, He's a grasshopper they're... from the beginning of googly eyes. That's what I'm what I meant to say. Oh yeah yeah yeah, they do. They're very goofy. I really like the sort of. They're they're almost like wild dogs, like or like stray dogs, not wild, but like stray dogs who kind of like are like wanting to scrounge a little bit of the food that Arietti's got. <laughs> which, which, by the way, is interesting in how animals are depicted. Like, like yeah. the way we see bugs up close is almost like as like cute little beings that you like have as pets or play around with or whatever. Exactly. Whereas the the cat like is a monster. Like, it, I I was a kid whose grandmother had a cat who fucking hated me. So I know how <laughs> oh, scary no. cats are. And this cat is, is scary. Like when the when the cat fucking runs after Arietti and you see the, the cat like as a huge monster screaming and screeching. And, you know, that's, yeah. that's the, an, nasty. Another monstrous animal is the crow, right? When, oh, yeah. When, when yeah. he gets stuck in the window uh, screen and then his flapping wings is like creating this like crazy gust of wind that's threatening to blow Arietti away. Yeah, and, and you know, I've, I've given how to a, a bad rap, but I gotta say, like, she really fucked that crow up good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how you gotta do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, crow, the scene just, with the crow was really charming in dress. terms of the animation. Oh yeah, just like, yeah, really exciting without being, without being like really scary or threatening. Like, like no. that, that, that's like kid movie level scary, you know? Oh no! Which I mean, ki- kids should have the, those kinds of, uh, you know, heart heart beating scenes sometimes. You know, for sure. Yeah, since we're since we were just talking about Spiller, um, like, and and we're gonna move on to and we talking about the cat. These two characters, I want I want to bring up how they they kind of reminded me of other characters from the Ghibli canon, um, or even before. Like Spiller to me, uh, reminds me a lot of. Uh, Jimsy from uh, Future Boy Conan, which is also a movie about the dichotomy of like imperialism versus communal living and like naturalism and uh, resourcefulness and stuff. Imperialism um, versus monkey people. <laughs> not monkey. No, the community. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, Jimsy <laughs> and Conan are monkey people, but like they they become part of a community that is more of like a you know a farming community. A, you know, uh, uh, homesteading and stuff like that. And, um, no, but I like Jim, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, Spiller is like Jimsy, uh, in that way. I don't know. He just reminds me a lot of Jimsy. And then the cat being pretty much an explicit reference to, uh, uh, the cat returns, you know, the, the cat Muta, he even has the same yeah. pattern, which, by the way, this cat that was in The Cat Returns and was also the cat that uh, was in um, Whisper, Whisper of the Heart, Heart yeah. was a cat that was, uh, like, I don't think it belonged to any one person, but it was, like, a stray cat that came into the Studio Ghibli one day and, like, all the staff members, like, uh, liked it, but it would like you know it would go and do its own thing. Sometimes it would be wild and go, and then it would come back to the studio. And it was uh, the name of the cat was Moon, I think. But yeah. um, but yeah, it, in the in the Cat Returns, there's this uh, there's this feud between Muta, the big fat cat, and 
uh, the crow Toto. And <laughs> like at the beginning of this movie, the crow oh, yeah, comes yeah. and attacks Muta. <laughs> that fucking <laughs> back. It's like, I'll get you, bird brain. <laughs> Confirmed. Same universe. Whisper of the Same Heart, universe. the cat returns, and Arietti. Yeah. We have cat uh, there, dimension, and we have little people. <laughs> I don't know if we want to finish up anything about the characters first, but there's a couple other Easter eggs that I wanted to mention before we wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I'm good, so go ahead. Okay, cool. So, uh, if you can remember, uh, Arietti's dad... Um, no. Pod... Ha- during the <laughs> I stop. completely forgot no. about him. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> during during the borrowing, he mm. has this little leather helmet with goggles on it, that is the exact same design as the uh, as the as the helmet design from Nausicaa. Oh. Mm. Um, Wait, let me see. Yeah. Yeah. Look it up. Oh. Yeah. It's a reference. Um, what else? Okay. Uh, and I don't know. I feel like. Uh, these references to these other Ghibli movies, I mean, obviously Miyazaki also wrote the screenplay of this one. So, you know, there's a lot of thematic carryover, but I just think it's really cool that Yonabayashi was just kind of like... Yeah, throwing the Easter Doing some fan service yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's um, borrowing. Probably because he himself... Yeah, well, yeah. Borrow, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. What else? Oh, yeah. Um... Did I already cover everything else? Oh, no, no. So there's a scene. Um, there, there are two scenes which are like uh, sort of parallels to scenes in Totoro. One is when Spiller, after, after it's at the end of the movie, when after um, Arietti is like looking back, you know, she's riding the teapot down the stream and she's looking back and... Spiller like hands her a raspberry, uh, yeah, and yeah. and he hands it to her in the same way as the as the little boy from Totoro hands the umbrella to to Satsuki and May when it's raining, like he's he's like facing um, the other way, perpendicular yeah, well. to her, and like gestures with his hand outstretched once and then again. It's the exact same. It's the exact same uh, gesture, um, and perspective. Uh, which I thought was cute. And then the, you know, Arietti thanking the cat for leading, um, for leading show to her at the end and, and petting its nose exactly like Satsuki and May petting the cat bus's nose at the end of Totoro. Right, and it's, it's the same size difference. That's, that, that, that's such a Ghibli trope, like a cat leading you to some place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, wow. that's the whole yeah, thing. It yeah, it really is. Holy Wait, I mean Miyazaki even explicitly That's like five ex- different movies. Yeah, <laughs> Miyazaki even di- ex- explicitly explained it. Like Whisper of the Heart, like the cat scene is the cat is guiding you to another world there in Whisper of the mm-hmm. Heart to find like the shop, to find the shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then that, of course you know in the Cat Returns, the Baron and or Muta leads leads uh, Haru to which by the way that character's name is Haru <laughs> as well. The, the protagonist of uh, the Cat Returns. Um, well, she really let herself go, huh? <laughs> no, don't say that. No, <laughs> no, no, bad. No, not the same character. Not the same Haru character. stopped turning into a cat to turn into a toad. Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus. So, yeah, so, yeah. And then, um, yeah, there's this movie. Uh, well, anyways. Um those were all the yeah. those were all of the uh, ex- yeah, like the, explicit direct Easter eggs that I could find. But I will say that the um, the the scene there is one scene that I just really love uh, from Arietti. Just the the look of it, both the background and the foreground, and that's when Sho is like laying down on the little sloping hill, going down to the pond, and he's got like his arm, like he's resting his head on his arms. Uh, crossed behind his head against the stone and there's all these beautiful wildflowers in the foreground and it really reminded me like some like foreground uh, art from like 
uh, Anne of Green Gables or something like that. Like the flowers in such detail and just the light shining. It was just a gorgeous oh, yeah, just, scene. Just a big shout out to the backgrounds in, in, in this oh, whole yeah. fucking movie. Just 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 absolutely stellar work. Like 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 part part of it, I think I think this is just like Studio Ghibli just working like really well together. I think that's part of why they, they could hand the reins to uh, to Yonabayashi, who's so inexperienced. It's exactly because yeah. all of these talented uh, like leads in different uh, departments and all these people they've been working together with for like probably decades at this point, just a well-oiled machine churning out amazing work. And and yeah. that is actually something that Yonabayashi has also commented well on, that even though he's younger... Like he was happy that a lot of the older stuff would help him out so much. Like he he's been really thankful about how much of the project these older members at Studio Ghibli could carry. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's another thing I, I want to like uh, explore a little bit before uh, before we uh, wrap things up. Is like we mentioned before that uh, we we definitely should give Yonobiashi credit for like nailing this um distinct look of uh, of how the small and the normal sized like people their, their worlds differentiating them without like without it feeling jarring uh, which like but like exactly how he does it is, is a bit more complicated i think um but p- parts of it are in the character designs uh like the yeah. level of detail and layers that there are on the human character's clothes uh, is, is, is a bit different. Uh, and it's specifically like they have folded collars. All the human characters yeah. have folded collars, which adds a, a, adds a sense, of, sense of like uh, the, 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 the texture of real clothes where yeah. the little Extra people... Extra material. All, yeah. And the little people all have like really simple clothes. The patterns that they that they use in their house and on their clothes uh, are really simple. Where if you take a look at like the patterns, ju- just in like the woodwork of the walls or the uh, picture frames or the uh, the bed sheets and all that in in the human world, it's much more detailed. Yeah, ornate. Um, and and so uh, I don't think it's exactly a difference in detail because like we mentioned earlier like the detail of the little people's home is like really high there's a lot of really cool sure. stuff when you take a look it, the, i think the difference is in the texture in, in, in yeah. the way that the textures are, are detailed between the two worlds yeah. um and another thing that i that i've uh, that, that i make note of is um the way that uh things are cut together when you have a clo- close-ups of the human characters, especially of Sho, they get to fill a lot of the screen. Yeah. Like yeah. especially in scenes where Sho and uh, and Arietti uh, interact with each other, Sho gets to like fill the whole screen, and and like the, the first time he talks to her, his mouth is just the whole frame is just like his mouth talking. Whereas like the close-ups of Arietti or her father or anything, they are close and we can clearly read their expressions, but they don't fill everything they, they don't get to fill up as much space uh yeah. like cinematically speaking which yeah. like and, and sometimes they're never they're just presented really, as this, this massiveness yeah and and, and that's the, these really really good touches of like transition shots between the big the large scale and the small scale um like uh Arietti will, will will drop the sugar cube down and we will see a mm. detailed shot of it falling. And that sound is what transitions us to Sho's perspective as, as he uh, perks up and uh, and takes a look. Um, or yeah. when, when we're shown the little dollhouse, you'll have these transition shots of Haru opening the uh, the dollhouse and then we get to see the detailed shots of the, the things inside there. Oh, I just thought of it's, another it's, Easter egg. It's I just really, we- really well directed, uh, is, is what I'm saying. And, I, and I'm starting yeah. to notice like the little tricks that are used to uh, to like move us between uh, different yeah. perspectives. Just to add on really to that cool. a little just, bit, just, just really well done. Yeah. To to give to give Yonobayashi his due credit is this movie for me a lot of what this movie is saying and doing right on visuals and audio and framing and uh, juxtapositions that happen entirely in camera space, in visual space, in the language of color, or texture, and to nail this is the sign of a really really good director. And I think that that is absolutely 
worthy of every bit of praise we can throw at this. Yeah, a lot of visual storytelling also. Lots of scenes totally. with no dialogue where we can follow them, follow it exactly. And that is yes. like, that is, more than anything else is like a sign of a good director. Indeed. Yeah, it is so easy. not that much dialogue in this movie. Yeah, it's surprisingly hard to like tell, like clearly tell like different, like, like exact narratives without dialogue. We also yeah. like in this podcast to fall into the trap of talking about Miyazaki a whole fuck ton, but it's really, you know... Yeah. <laughs> noteworthy that this movie is directed by Onobayashi and he did it. He really did it. What a what a guy. Yeah, what a yeah. guy. Great job. Yeah. Not to be overshadowed by Miyazaki's Great script. job, Maro-san. Uh, vo- 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 voice, you, you noticed another uh, Easter egg we're, we're yeah, missing? Yeah, you mentioned the dollhouse and like going into how everything in that and in the, the home of the humans has like this ornate texture to it. There's this... Uh, and um, that reminded me, the dollhouse, the interior of the dollhouse is actually, uh, to me at least, was strikingly similar to the interior design of the uh, of the cat bureau from The Cat Returns. Because, like, and maybe it's just a Victorian era thing, but, like, mm, yeah. in the cat bureau, like, it also has that Victorian style where there's the first half of the room is this... Uh, you know, Victorian tea parlor. And then the the back half of the room is the Baron's desk and bookshelf. Um, mm. And to me, at the, the, the top floor being the, um, the sort of desk or the, the office with the bookshelf and then the bottom floor being with the, with the tea table uh, reminded me a lot of the, that house from yeah. the cat returns I, I i don't think that's an easter egg i think that's just like some of the same people working uh, on it perhaps, with the same source of inspiration perhaps, but, but it when, looks it but looks yeah, remarkably that. similar in terms of the actual design of the like the interior design and placement of furniture and things like that but perhaps not it, perhaps it's not an easter egg as you said egg um <laughs> all right um <laughs> uh, uh, another like j- just a really quick thing i just wanted to mention that kind mm. of bugs me whenever I watch this movie and then I forget about it. Um, so there's this scene very early on as uh, as Arietti is going on her first borrowing exploration with her father and they're walking up the walls and she's like, oh, this is fun. And then there are a couple of rats that are running around at the bottom of the walls while they're like climbing up there. And he's like, oh, rats, watch out for them. And we never see them again. Yeah. That's, that's that just, just kind of me. true. <laughs> that's a setup for a later scene that got cut. Yeah, I the, rats, to God. the rats should <laughs> have been Chekhov's gun. Yeah, th- th- there's, there's no Chekhov's rat. Like, it's just, it, they're, <laughs> they're just, like, mentioned and then forgotten about. Like, not even, like, there, I swear to God, in some draft, there was a scene where Arietti or someone got chased by rats and then mm-hmm. uh, Nia comes in and saves him. Oh, oh yeah. And, 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 <laughs> totally and, and that would be the moment <laughs> where, cat, like, yeah. The, where there's this reconciliation where like, oh, you chased me before, but now now we're cool. All right. I swear, th- that would be my best guess. <laughs> but like, like, my yeah. last thing I want to mention the is, uh, is the the way that the water droplets are animated. Yes. Because like, a, yes. at that small scale, you know, they are like, their shape, it, their, their sort of spherical shape is still more intact because the surface tension in comparison to the size like keeps them that way and like the little water basin they have in their home when when the the water drops from the you know from the where it's being collected um and it falls into the basin it has the 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 aftershock droplet that comes out and then goes back in and there's like little waves and the same thing happens with like the rain um it's just there's a lot of really neat, uh, like, verisimilitude there. Surface tension uh, is yeah. Surface respected. tension is the, is the word for it. Yeah. When the tea yeah, uh, comes, is po- respect- when the tea comes pouring out yeah. of the 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 tea, the tea oh, yes. thing, yeah. you know, it's so 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 lovingly thought out. There's like, like a yeah. huge yeah. glop, and that just fills the cup, and that's it. Yeah, at because that scale, tension, water is actually really viscous. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and and also when she gets in from the rain and she just like removes the droplets from herself, like she doesn't get soaked. She just has, has a few right. droplets on her, like she could just move move off. Which is right. also how like that's also how insects survive the rain because like it's not really it doesn't really make them wet. It's just like 
Yeah, because Dro- the water yeah. sort of globs up them. like a, some yeah. gelatin or something like that. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't soak them through. It sort yeah. of guamps. Guamp. Which, which, which kind <laughs> of um, <laughs> like we, we, we talked about before? How how like th- this is a really old idea. This fascination with like what life must be like if if one was like really small. Uh, and, scale, and, yeah. and, and yeah, and it's, it, it's something that like you, you see in a lot of cultures ha- have like stories uh, around these lines. Uh, one of them, like fr- from my home country, country uh, H.C. Anderson's uh, Thumbelina, uh, Thumbelisa is the original title, um, mm-hmm. j- j- which is uh, about like, like a small fairy tale uh, about a, a little girl uh, born out of a um, out of a tulip. Uh, blooming uh, and 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 she she's just an inch tall um which is why she's called thumbelina by the way because an inch in danish is called a tumme which is where we get our word for thumb um anyway um so like there's also these details in that uh, story about how uh how how she uses a, a leaf as a, as a, as a duvet um or how she, uh, she she can like um, she can live off the, the dew of of uh, of leaves and, and the sweetness out of flowers, which is like th- that same idea. You can kind of see it here. I, I just thought that that would be worth mentioning. Um, Very cool. And, and, and another Danish thing that this also reminds me of is uh, the uh, uh, like the, the the folklore of uh, of uh, the nisse, um, which is a really small elf like creature that lives in the attic and uh so oftentimes like especially like the further back you go the more of a, of a shithead they are you know uh, <laughs> you know like little tricksters um but but you you leave them a bit of um like rice porridge uh just let them have that and they'll they'll be cool with you um and often mm-hmm. they are depicted in, in this way as just like people on a really small scale um which which also like uh, and they're also associated with Christmas like they they're, they're sort of be- become absorbed into the whole Santa Claus nonsense be- becoming like Santa's helpers types. <laughs> I see. Um, so so I, I just thought that that might also have been like part of the folklore that inspired the original uh, story uh, in English. And I okay. want to end this uh, with the last thing that I want to bring up, which is. We're gonna reveal the truth about the borrowers, who they really are, <gasps> in by invoking a Miyazaki quote. Um, I translated this from the the German translation of an interview I've seen, so it may be a bit loose. So don't take this as a direct quote. But um, what he thought sort of remarkable about the borrowers is that with the borrowers, you can see how they construct their lives from what they have borrowed, borrowed, how they voluntarily choose the life in which they have created their world. That's what's fascinating about them. Like a candle in the wind, they remind me of artists. So what the borrowers are, in his view, has to do also with art, to choose how to assemble your world. And with this, with all the analysis that we've done, I think to tie this yeah. in is like a beautiful thing as like a life drive to survive and sustainability and repurposing and assembling your life out of the cultural fragments of the world around you is also like an artist because with you mentioning Samlina and these other potential influences, that is how an artist works. Influences come from somewhere. They are integrated, repurposed into new artwork, and the creative process is all about borrowing and repurposing. And the borrowers are kind of like that. And in a way, Miyazaki posits like a thesis about the world, about people, about life, in which we all are part of processes of repurposing our material environment, creatively using influences of art, culture, material properties around us, and that this is kind of how we, as a species, survive in this complicated network of culture and junk <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it ties into Great. like this whole japanese ideal and and miyasaki specifically is like very much uh like influenced by this notion of artist as craftsman and craftsman as artist like uh art as a a a work of uh, of labor that, that that you can like hone your craft rather than just like something innate and springing from nothing. 
um, and which, we will, which is quite yeah. nice. And we will definitely yeah. return to the idea of artist and meaning of life, raison d'etre, uh, uh, one's own personal oh meaning in The Wind Rises. Massively. Absolutely, yeah. All right, well... Um, Great. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's Arietti, the borrower, the secret world of Arietti, uh, and Arietti, a Japanese word I forgot. Um, Karigurashi. Karigurashi, no Arietti, no, yeah. Um, which, it, it, in a way, is like, it's a Miyazaki movie without the Miyazaki um, well, yeah, which yeah, w w w which is fascinating in, in a way, and and and, and the Why question we gotta of, say it like uh, that at the very end. It's a Yonabayashi movie. No, no, yeah, but like th that's <laughs> it is a Miyazaki movie with Yonabayashi, <laughs> with Yonabayashi as director instead. You know? um, yeah, and, and, and there, there's there, there's there's definitely um, a sense of vision, but like the, the the question of whose it is is I think still up in the air, kind of. We um, understand that Miyazaki maybe it's just the has, work. Maybe yeah. the work just has ends up having vision at the end of the whole process. But but I, I, I right. say that I, I describe it that, that way with with love and with respect to Yonobayashi because, like mentioned earlier, so much of this movie is like just the whole studio like putting their talents to work, like the animation, the backgrounds, uh, also the music, uh, th though it might not be integrated as well, which might be partly because they got someone from outside uh, to do it. Filthy I, I, I just, outsiders. Yeah, I just I just find that really interesting, that, that, and and that like that's part of like this movie's identity is that whole like, um, is it, that whole lack of like cl uh, clear like this is exactly like who made it and why and how um i i just um and and i stand by like what i said near the beginning that this movie is really comfortable being itself it's it, it's really content to be this little uh yeah this this like smaller scale story filled with like uh, charm and fun ideas and uh and they're like sort of bittersweet but not necessarily like a deeply profound ending, uh, depending on how you read it, um, and and and, and it's not content grandiose. that way. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's part what part of what makes it like really like watchable and nice and agreeable. Um, but but I I also think that's that might be what Miyazaki keeps adding to his movies is this extra thing, this this extra ambition to like do even more. Um, mm. And I, th I think this movie does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a really nice uh, l uh, little movie about little people living in someone's house. And, and you hear that concept and this just really delivers. You, and you have to give them credit for that. And, and as this, yeah. this cast has clearly like demonstrated, there is more under the surface. Uh, there absolutely is. And indeed. Um, and I, I, I just... Yeah. Yeah. We should stay tuned yeah. to follow Yonobayashi's journey as a director with the upcoming movies of his, which we will also be covering. Uh, it will be a while till the Mani cast and subsequently the Mary and the Witches Flower cast, but they will come and we will <clears throat> be able to see how Yonobayashi fares without the you know, strong influence of um, Miyazaki's screenplay writing in the background. And I just want to emphasize again, Miyazaki's hand was all over this project in terms of the screenplay but as i said very in the very beginning he refused to look at the storyboards so at the very least we know everything relating to the visuals yeah. is yonobayashi's handwriting and all the creative and amazing work put in by everyone else at studio ghibli except miyazaki who didn't want to touch it <laughs> there you go yep so uh, yeah, remember, kids. Uh, private property is theft, and uh, and <laughs> tiny girls are cute. Uh, that's uh, that's our Yeti. <laughs> All right, we will see you next time when we cover uh, uh, when we follow up on another young younger Ghib Ghibli director. In when we see and talk about Goro Miyazaki's second film, which is from Up on Poppy Hill. 
which is, in my opinion, a very fascinating film, um, a, a period piece, a nostalgia film, but also shows a much, much, much developed Goro Miyazaki as a director. So uh, stay tuned for that. It will come out on this channel or if you follow us on Spotify or on Lipsyn or subscribe to us on your podcasting app. And it would really help us out if you considered dropping in a, a, a little bit of uh, your extra earnings so we can borrow it from you in order to provide more podcasts with our Patreon, patreon.com slash narsecast with double A and no umlaut. Uh, um, thanks so much for listening to this podcast and see you and hear you next month when From Up and Poppy Hill will be covered. And until then, goodbye. Bye. Bye.